unmute yourself, Louise. You need to unmute yourself. I'm sitting here doing all this talking to you all and nobody but Craig. Thank you, Craig. <laughs> oh, and Valerie, you did too. I didn't have it on the comment section. Valerie said it too. Poncho didn't say a word to me about it. He just in there. Uh, yes, I did. You just quietly. couldn't hear me. Um, I'm sitting there like, just talking away, talking my little head off. So I just want to thank you guys for coming over and hanging out with us. Talking about live, uh, live, live, with all the live mistakes, right? So thank you guys for coming in and hanging out with us and sharing, uh, sharing your time and spending your day with us. Uh, so I'm going to bring uh, Poncho because I already told you about him. You just didn't hear me. Um, Poncho has just uh, been immortalized by his uh, town of, in Baltimore, Maryland. They actually displayed a 52-foot digital billboard in his town, in the middle of town, of his artwork. It was phenomenal. It was phenomenal. Could you imagine your hometown putting your artwork up on a 52-foot digital billboard? Right? Come on, four pounds, where's mine? So, uh, but yeah, and Poncho's work has been seen in TV shows, A Different World, Green Sleeve, just all kinds of movies and things like that. He is, uh, he is a, a, what is called, a, I think it's prolific, whatever the P word is, prolific uh, uh, artist. He paints and creates daily. He is a nonstop, uh, he and Charlie Palmer, they are nonstop artists. They create, it's like, um, they have programs where you know he has they it's not a sabbatical they have a quarantine where they create art just daily all day long just create art and so trust me sitting in and, and listening to this young man talk is just going to be life-changing it'll be life-changing because the, the the nuggets that you get out of here you will take with you forever um so I'm going to bring him up. He's down there hiding out behind his name. So I'm going to bring him up. I'm going to shrink me uh, so that we can. Oh, there he is. There he is hanging out. So here he is, Mr. Larry Poncho Brown. Hello there. Can you hear me good enough out there? And now he's muted. Am I muted? I can't hear you. Why can't I hear him? Let me see. I think you're fine. I think it's Can fine. you hear me? Can you guys hear him? Testing one, two, three. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me, Louise? Oh, you're not muted. They can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, so you're muted. I'm trying to see if everybody's okay out there. How's everybody doing? As you can tell, live uh, live broadcasting has its challenges. <laughs> but we're going to try to make it move along. Thank you guys for tuning in. If you guys can hear me okay, let me know. That's good because I'm about to get started. You know, Louise Cutler puts together something pretty magical here, and it gives you a chance to step into each one of the artist's world. So this is your chance to kind of check in to my world. So I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to get started and we're just going to go through it. And if you got questions along the way, I'm sure uh, Louise will cut in and make sure we're able to do that. Let's see if we can do this. All right. Let me see here. I want to get this thing started the right way. All right. So here we go. I'm getting ready to start. 
getting ready to get started right now with a little presentation. It's going to give you a little bit of background about who I am and what I do. Um, this is simply called Humble Beginnings. Um, see if we can get this thing started. One second here. All right. So... My name is Larry Poncho Brown. My family um, name is Larry O'Neill Brown Jr. And that man you see sitting in that chair is my father. And that lady you see standing by his side is my mother. They both were teenage parents. They had me when they were 16 and 17 years old. That's my humble beginning. That's me and my dad. Um, I was the only son. I had two sisters. My dad is an artist. He was a first generation artist. He never knew his father, but my father had this immense talent and most of it was self-taught. The problem was my dad was born in 1945 and during that period of time, there were no outlets for African-American artists. And by the time he had me in 1962, there still were not anything available for artists to participate in. So although my dad had all this talent bottled up inside of him, he ended up being a frustrated artist because there weren't many opportunities for him. As a young child, I imitated everything he did artistically. As you see right here, I'm standing beside a Rodin sculpture. How many black kids you know have a model of a Rodin sculpture in their house? That was my upbringing, despite the fact that we came from a very, very poor family. The clothes you see here are all clothes that were hand down. If you look at those shoes, no, they do not fit me. They had newspaper in the toes. That was the way we did things. Then very simply, my parents took care of us the best way that they could. And I learned a lot of values being born in Baltimore of how to make things work with little or nothing. That was me at a magical age when I asked my, my teacher told me to stand up and, and tell what you wanted to be when you grew up. Everybody in the class got up and said doctors, lawyers, teachers. And I stood up proudly with my yellow shirt on, with my chest poked out. And I said, I either want to be a yellow school bus driver or an artist. And everybody in the class broke out laughing. Yellow booths, uh, a yellow, <laughs> a yellow school, a bus school, a school bus driver. I only wanted to be a yellow school bus driver because the bus would pass me every day going to school and I just wished I could ride the bus to school. I didn't say that the fact that those buses had special students on it, but you know, when you're a child, you want what you want. But when she said uh, the teacher interrupted the class from laughing, she corrected them by saying, being a sc yellow school bus driver is an honorable job which really confused me because I was like, well, she didn't even mention being an artist. Maybe that's why they're laughing. So that was the beginning of me trying to understand what an artist was. Here is uh, me at an important stage. Check out that Afro, y'all. It's trying to grow. It's trying to grow. But I was trying to learn a lot. And at that time, I was drawing all the time. During this period, my dad, I think, decided he didn't want me to be as frustrated as he was. So he kind of pulled away from me a little bit. He moved into printing. He was so busy trying to take care of his family that he maybe didn't have the time he needed to have to nurture me in the arts. But nevertheless, I kept drawing. I had an imagination. Um, as you can see, I couldn't match clothes worth for nothing. But <laughs> that was the way I was brought up. It was that kind of lifestyle, you know. Um I also went through a Bruce Leroy stage because one of my other interests, martial arts, I did martial arts all through uh, high school and then through college. Um, and that what I, that's what I thought I was going to get further into. I thought, well, maybe I'll start a, um, a, a art studio painting signs or maybe I'll um, start a, a martial arts studio. You know, you fast, you fantasize about a lot of things in your progression. So mentorship. And I think this is an important section because everybody needs mentorship. Everybody. Uh, without that, we have nothing. You know what I'm saying? Um, this is my father and myself. And I was a, a eager child. I always wanted to, to do everything he was doing. That painting standing behind us is a painting that my dad started and never finished. Um at that time, there was me trying to be like him, but he really was 
hesitant about pursuing the arts. And at that time, I decided I was going to pick up the baton and run uh, ahead of him and just do my art. Let's see here. Keep it going. Sorry about that. Um, all right. There you go. All right. So along the way, I decided, you know, I need to really start figuring out how I want to do this art thing. So my dad, he was first generation. I'm second generation. This is one of my dad's paintings. This painting is a, a crucifixion piece. This painting was done in 1969 to show you the talent that my father had in 1969 as a self-taught artist. This piece is done in oil paint, okay? The next piece I'm gonna show you is something he did later in life called uh, Come Home My People, which was inspired after one of my paintings called Heaven Sent, which is part of my portfolio. This man right here is my second father. You'll hear me make reference to him throughout this whole conversation. His name is Chanel Alford. He was the instructor over at Carver Vocational Technical High School, where me and my father both attended. He was a friend of my father's. They went to school together. But I went from um, a middle school where I, I was being taught by a man by the name of David Humphreys. David Humphrey was the first person to sit down and tell me, hey, Pancho, you need to stop playing in my class and start taking art more seriously. And so what Mr. Humphreys did was he took the time to show me how to do bulletin boards. He had me doing uh, displays for plays. And then by the time I got ready to go to high school, I met this guy. This guy right here is 6'5", but back then he had a back afro that made him almost seven feet tall, big shoes with heels. And this man looked at me when I first walked into his class and he said, son, you're a descendant of kings. You have to act a certain way in my class. And I immediately thought to myself, this man is crazy. I don't even know why I'm here. But this man had another talent. This was some of his paintings that he did when he was in college. You know, Alpha was a hell of an artist, but he also taught commercial art. So for most people out there that wonder each artist's path, my start was in commercial art. I was trained as a commercial artist. Um, what that means is I learn how to paint signs, okay? Um, I have to kind of break down to you what actually happened during that period of time because um, it was magical. Okay, so I step into Mr. Chanel Alford's class. He, um, he looked me in the face and he said, you know, white people will never let you do the kind of art you want to do. So let me show you how to letter and you will always eat. That was my indoctrination into his commercial art program. I, what was I to say? I didn't know what I wanted to do that time. At that time I was doing art all the time. I, I, I decided I wanted to car, go to Carver to follow my, my dad's footsteps. I uh, didn't really have the support of my father like I thought I wanted, but I had already made the determination that that's what I wanted to do for my career, okay? So I walk into this man's class. He immediately assigns me to a lady by the name of Barbara Thomas. And Barbara Thomas at that time was the fastest letterer in Baltimore City. I kid you not. This woman was about 5'4", but you put a lettering brush in your hand, look out. She was a beast. If guys were painting the side of a truck, she would finish her side of the truck and then go over and help them finish their side of the truck. I am not exaggerating. So in this program, I learned how to letter, and she was my assigned teacher. It was a three-year program where you would learn uh, the principles of design, layout, uh, composition um, and hand lettering. Hand lettering was a specialty area because in commercial art back in that period of time, that's predominantly what we did was painted signs. Okay. So my upbringing was learning how to paint signs. The program was supposed to be three years and then th third year you would be assigned work study. But because I caught on to lettering so quickly, I learned it in three months. And so with three months of education, they had to decide whether they were going to give me work study or not. And I was one of the first students to receive work study in the 10th grade from Carver Vocational Technical High School. So I'm going to move on. That's my foundation. I am a commercial artist. Some artists start in one realm. Um, like, you know, we listened to Charlie Palmer yesterday. He came from the commercial realm as a graphic designer. Uh, Thomas Lockhart is in our group. He started as a graphic designer. So everybody doesn't start in one facet of the arts. I came from a commercial background. So 
This was my first job assignment. Chanel Alford dispatched me to a company by the name of Washington Signs. And Washington Signs, I did truck lettering, as you see above it, my head, it's silk screen, and we did all that stuff. And that's me at 14 years old. And this was the first job I painted for Mr. Washington. It was two plywood signs, uh, three quarter inch plywood signs. It was all done in industrial um, uh, synthetic uh, lettering paint. Um, as you see, I got more paint on me than I got on the signs, but this was my very first job at the age of 14. I can't tell you what vocational education did for me because being in vocational education gave me, um, it, it taught me how to hustle my craft. And if I had to say, what a real changing point in, in how I was able to do things a little differently than some artists is that because I came from that indoctrination, getting in front of people to sell my art was not something that was a problem for me. So this is my first job at Washington Signs at the age of 14. But by the time I turned 17, I had started my own sign company. Along the way, I met a lot of people. I know we don't talk about this gentleman much anymore because of some of the things that's happened in history, but I must tell you, it was pivotal for me to meet him at the early part of my career because I got my first real illustration job from Morgan State University, and they commissioned me to do a poster of uh, Mr. Cosby because he was coming to do it a fundraising benefit at their HBCU. This is the, my very first illustrative poster that I did of Bill Cosby. As you can see, the year was 1987. I started my publishing company uh, with my art in 1985. So during this period of time, y'all, I was painting a lot of work. I was doing work all the time. Um, when I show you some of the pieces I was doing around that time, I, I, I was doing a lot of work. I, I, I can't even tell you what a lot means because y'all hear a lot. You hear, you see something. But by the time you finish with this whole presentation, you'll get an idea of how much work I actually created at that time. This is me uh, and Ed Gordon and the late Dick Gregory. And late Dick Gregory was also one of my big bricks because Dick Gregory was the first celebrity to endorse what I was doing as an artist. He bought me on as his artist. And during that period of time, I was doing all of the Bohemian, uh, the Dick Gregory Slim Safe Bohemian Diet Plan artwork. If you saw any of this work during that period of time, and many of you might be too young to remember that, but you older folks can remember it. This was an ad a campaign that was put in Jet Magazine, Ebony Jet Magazine. So uh, here I was, uh, not even 20 yet, y'all, and this is the kind of work I was being exposed to in my 20s. This ad would go um, be on billboards, magazines all over the country. And it really did, thanks to Mr. Gregory, uh, set my sales to do some other things. Along the way, I went through many phases as an artist. I started off with uh, um, doing um, comic book art. I started off doing, uh, I had an aspiration to be an animator. But I also started doing fantasy artwork. Fantasy artwork is me. I was doing animals. I was doing women. I was doing combinations of animals and women. It was just one of the many phases I went through long before I started doing images that were depictions of who we are. Uh, this piece was done in 1979, I believe. Uh, this was before my persona as Poncho came about. I just began to start signing Poncho on these paintings. Remember, my real name is Larry O'Neill Brown Jr. My dad's name is Larry O. Brown Sr. And because he was an artist and I was an artist, I needed to find my own direction. So I grabbed my nickname Poncho and started using that as my name. And this was where I really started to gain my identity as an artist, but had not gained my black consciousness yet. I'm gonna show y'all this right here. This is an example of the work I was doing in this phase. Shortly after my science fiction phase, I hit another phase and I'll just be quiet and let you see the video. Thank you. 
Okay, well, you know, every now and then you witness some technical difficulties on my computer. For some reason, it does not want to play that presentation. But what I will tell you is that I went to this heavy stage of wanting to learn how to do science fiction and fantasy. And that's what I ended up doing with my work. And I did that for several years until I decided, hey, you know, um, what am I going to do with this work? I, after uh, I went to Maryland Institute College of Art, I got a scholarship there. Um, it, it was a life altering situation because for the first time I went to all black schools and now all of a sudden I was in uh, all white school. OK, not only that, they put me into a class that was um, uh, they put me in English 101. Let's just put it out there. Here I was an inner city school that was uh, uh, in an inner city school. I was in an inner city school that was a pretty good school. And I was a 90 student in school. But by the time I got to college, with the advent of me doing vocational education and being out of the school half of the day, my academics was a little behind what it should have been. So what I got to Maryland Institute, which is one of the top five art schools in the country, because I had no intention of going to college, they put me in English 101. So being insulted, I said, OK, well, let me go ahead and do this. What also happened is because I did, I learned so much in my foundation year at Carver Vocational Technical High School, it gave me good footing to learn and switch to my academics. And in that academics, I think my life changed because um, where most of the white kids at the school were terrified of me and I was terrified of them, they put me in English 101. And who was in English 101? But all the foreign students who were learning English as a second language. And so they adopted me and started showing me other things. If they were in other courses, they were showing me what they were working on, talked about religion, world events, and a lot of other things. So to make it, uh, put it mildly, I learned a lot during that period of time. So I think that my computer probably did a little U-Haul because I have so many programs open. So I'm going to sit here and I'm going to quiet some of those things down as I continue to talk. And we will resume that presentation like uh, really soon. All right. So I get out of college. I have a portfolio. I attended one of the best art schools in the country. I, my, my discipline was um, graphic design. You know, I was funny. I, when I went to the Maryland Institute, I didn't realize by me signing up for, say, general fine arts versus commercial art, that when I signed up for that class, I was immediately demeriting myself as a graphic designer because the general fine art department, they were looked at as in higher esteem. As a matter of fact, commercial art was looked down on and by many of the classes that was at the Maryland Institute College of Art. When I got into the art business, I realized that same duality was going on. There was this fine art world and there was this commercial art world. And it was almost like there were two gangs. They didn't understand how each other worked. And you ran into a certain amount of problems just because you didn't know where you fit. I didn't know where I fit. I loved art, but I, I, the, the classification of me being just a graphic designer always set me a little bit off center. And so uh, I, I know a lot of you in there right now because, see, you have to find it's like two gangs, you know, the fine art people think totally different than the commercial art people do. OK, the commercially successful artists, when you talk about Charlie Palmer and some of these other artists that have been on the show this week and Paul Goodnight, they've all taken kind of a separate path. Many of them came from commercial art or graphic design. Kevin was also from graphic design. Thomas Lockhart is from graphic design. But that's that's not a box. That, that determines where your end result is going to be. So despite all the rejection I got trying to do this art game from a commercial background, I found a way to carve my own road. And I think as an artist, you have to carve what road is for you. It's like the gang assignment. Figure which gang you belong to and adapt to whatever that gang is. Now, I've watched some people wear two gang jackets. You know, we talked about the, the, the mighty Paul Goodnight. He was very commercially successful, but now he's very successful on the fine art side. Joe Holston was also um, 
an artist that was commercially successful that moved to the fine art side. You got some artists that are just commercially successful. Charles Bibbs is a commercially successful artist. Larry Poncho Brown is a commercially successful artist. So if you're confused about what that is, this is a time to really think about it because the world has changed quite a bit. Um, so that was my upbringing, I, I, my vocational education. I went to college, I learned graphic design, I came out into this world. The one thing I had going for me was my hustle. You know, So sign painting was the first direction I was gonna go because that's what I learned and that's what I was pretty proficient at. As a matter of fact, my sign painting talent is what paid my way through college. Simple, simply put, between me doing job, like most kids were eating apples and reading books in the middle of, of, of school day, I was running out doing sign jobs and coming back. So all the way through high school, from the time I was 17 all the way through, I was doing the sign business to survive. Where most artists were probably on the street selling art and doing a bunch of other stuff. At that time, I was still trying to find myself as an artist. And it was a bit of a challenge for a while there because a lot of people uh, didn't know um, where to put me. And I was also in that place where I was always trying to figure out, well, where do I fit? You know, when I was in the sign world, I was even alienated because most of the sign people were white. They weren't black. I, I was always the youngest one everywhere. And I was always the blackest one everywhere. So I got a break with Barry Levinson. He shot a movie here in Baltimore called Avalon. And um, because I was such a proficient sign painter, people started calling me to do jobs for movies. OK, and for commercials in the area. And so here I was 17, 18, 19 years old, 20 years old doing sign painting for commercials. OK, and so that was another transition I made from doing my graphic design work where I was doing signs in the community to moving into another realm, which was almost like film. And that changed my life forever. And so I'm saying is that, you know, you never really get a chance to hear the roads that many people tra tra uh, travel to get to their destination. My road was really full of a, a lot of twists and turns. And it was full of a lot of setbacks. And it was full of a lot of no's. It was full of a lot of rejection. Uh, and all I'm saying to you is that, you know, at some point you have to decide which one is important for you. And uh, for me, I made a pact to myself very early that I wanted to, to survive from my art. It's a simple pact. But with that pact came a tonacity with it. That means that, sure, I could have went and got me a job doing something on the side or doing something that was not related. When I graduated from college, I made a pact to myself that no matter what I decided to do, that that was what I was going to do. I was going to I was just going to go ahead and survive from doing what I do best. And so that's, I think, the essence of who I am. That's what I'm hoping you guys will listen to as you get ready to, to um, settle in on what you're getting ready to do for your career. Um, I'm going to try to see if I can get this slide uh, back up on the screen again. See if I can do this. Let's see, share screen. Yeah, so it's, um, it's one of those kind of things. you you got to make a choice about where you are and believe in what your abilities are. And I immediately realize what my abilities were. So um, the rebirth happened in 1995. I had a major studio fire that completely made me have to start over in business. This was the Holland Street Exchange. It, it was a building that was eight stories tall, one city block long. On November the 10th, 1985, this building burned to the ground. And what us also burned to the ground was my dreams. So you're talking about an artist now that not only had one life as an artist, he had to create another whole life after 1995. Because you got to remember, I became commercially successful in the arts between 1985 and 1990. My ascent was, was too drastically high to even chart. I had always invested in my own business. I had always done things that were going to move my business completely forward. And here I was at this point where I was beginning to see a return on my investment. And I got hit with the Holland Street Exchange fire. The building burned to the ground along with all of my dreams. And um, I lost a million and a half worth of my life in that fire. But it also set the path for my next trajectory as an artist. Um, along the way, I met a lot of people and uh, we talked about a couple of them 
the day. And one of them that stood out in my mind and I first met him was Paul Goodnight. And so I'm going to show you this little thing. Hopefully it won't freeze like the last video did. But this is something that uh, in, in 2006, me and Charles Biggs, Bibbs partnered to do a, a creative quarantine. But one of the things I also decided to do in 2006 was to do sketches every day for one year. I had never done that before. These are all 10 minute sketches, 10, 15, 20 minute sketches in pencil. And the only criteria for this is that they had to be from my imagination. All right, so y'all see, um, this is I put this under my process because I don't think artists realize how much drawing goes into play with what we do. I think the artists have gotten so used to taking out a piece of canvas and doing what comes to their mind that they have not really understood. There's a certain amount of discipline that goes into what I do. So I showed you that for more than one reason. I told you I did 365 drawings that year, but I also want you to see the expanse of how much work I do. Um, I just don't do pretty pictures. And we have a lot in common, me and Charlie Palmer, in that we do a lot of studies. We do a lot of different renditions of pieces before we get to a final result. And so I wanted you to see that that is from my sketchbooks. So that means that most of those pieces have not been seen. And most of those pieces have been sold as my personal portfolio. I frame a lot of those in my show. So I'm going to add to that, um, uh, that portion of my process. All right. So when a, co a commission comes... Uh, a client will say, hey, look, I want to do something. I had an organization that wanted me to do an image that had to pertain to empowering the community to, to, to clean up their community. So I submitted this sketch first. Um, it's very simple line drawing. I use, I'm comfortable with pen. I'm comfortable with blue and black pen. I also do a lot of pencil studies. That was study number one. 
This was study number two. You might think those are the same drawing and I went back on them, but no, I actually did a whole separate drawing. There are little nuances between that first drawing I showed you and that second drawing I showed you. I'm still trying to get the placement of the figures. I'm still trying to capture the essence of a community. I'm still trying to capture the essence of a community and rebuilding the community. Uh, this was another version of that. As you can see, each time I do it, it refines. I add a tree, I subtract a tree, I add a cloud, I take a cloud, I take super things, some things to superimpose them. Um, this is my normal process before I jump into a painting, okay? Uh, now, I'm only showing you four of these sketches. This is the fourth sketch. Another rendition it, I added a church. I, I, I moved the figure from kneeling to another position. Um, but I want you to see the exploration I take with one piece. I actually ended up doing 10 sketches and these sketches are eight and a half by 11 before I did my final painting. But this is what I submit to my clients when they say, hey, Larry, I want you to do a piece for me. This is the final piece. Now, my work is a combination of acrylic. I work on canvas. Um, this piece is a partially collaged piece. This is a style that I've developed over several years. Um, this is the final piece. It's called Community Heritage Service. And yes, the client loved it. So that's part of my process. It's part of my process. I want you guys to really see the process because, um, you know, a lot of times we get going and we don't get a chance to really see how artists think and how artists work. Here's another project, another commission that was done for the Alzheimer's Association. And uh, they wanted me to do something with elders. I hadn't really done a lot of paintings with elders in it. Uh, they may have been stylized, but they, I've never actually formally done any pieces that were of elders. And so this was my first sketch. I was trying to figure out where things were going to be. It was about memory loss. It was about support. It was about love. It was about patience. It's about, uh, you know, uh, he, he's forgetting things. He's probably feeling a particular way. So I'm trying to capture the essence of it. Then I came back with this, which was totally different. You know, it's just um, I tried to show uh, the wallpaper patterns on the front and then things get simpler towards the back, the little squares on his heads or windows. I started doing this thing where, okay, what would somebody with that kind of condition, how would they even view looking out of a window? So your mind can go a lot of different places. I then said, okay, well, what happened if I did a little sketch where um, uh, someone is holding hands with another figure and they're supporting one another? You see, uh, I got that same old wallpaper pattern in the background, which I thought was an important motif at that stage of me doing what I was doing. Then, you know, some sketches are linear, like the first set I showed you where they were very related and I just resolved it by moving certain items. And some things are done completely different where every element is changed in the sketch. I will say it again. I did 10 sketches for this project, okay? Very, very important for you to understand that when you take on a project, especially a commission, let me explain to you what a commission is. A commission is where somebody comes to you and says, hey, I want you to do something for me. That means it's already a restriction because you gotta think and work towards satisfying a client. It's not when you like when you're doing your personal portfolio, you could just put whatever you want to put It's free energy. Uh, a, a commission sounds fun, but a commission comes with a restriction. You have to now try to communicate in, in uh, something that's going to be between you and your client. So I went back and forth. I submitted six sketches to this Alzheimer's Association project that I was working on. This is the final piece. It was a mixture of sketch num that sketched just before. Um, instead of using the pattern I was going to use on a wall, I, uh, they asked me could I utilize their logo in it. I put the uh, Alzheimer's Association logo in the curtains. But this is an idea of how a, a, a commission process works. Two different ways. One where I have linear sketches that are related and one where I have sketches that are totally unrelated. But it's still me exploring the piece long before I get to the final piece. And I think what happens with artists now, this is a different way of working. I'm not saying the way you work is wrong. I'm not saying the way that Charlie Palmer and the way I do this is right. But somewhere along the way, especially if you're self-taught, 
there are some ways you can cultivate your concepts before you get them down. Sometimes artists start and they're rigid and they're just determined to meet the finish line on what they're creating and they don't get a chance to explore the medium and explore the concepts that they're working with. And so I encourage you all, if you don't do a lot of sketching and you don't do a lot of drawing, go and buy your sketch pad. I was overhearing um, Paul Goodnight and he is, um, you know, when you talk about Paul Goodnight to other artists, other artists will say, oh, my God, this man is a genius. He is a he is a drawing and rendering genius. So Paul Goodnight was recounting to me a story of where he ran into a friend of his that was an artist. And his friend, as a critique, said to Paul, you are hiding behind your painting. You need to draw more. And I can't tell you how wide my mouth fell on the floor because he is my total mentee when it comes to mentor, when it comes to drawing. Paul Goodnight makes me draw more. And so to hear him have that kind of discipline at the level that he was at, I think that's something that I can share with all artists. If you're not drawing, you got a problem. You got to start from the beginning. It's not about the final result. It's about the journey. And I, I encourage you all to really look at how you approach your projects and you'll find you get a better result. Um, this is a list of the commissions that I've done. Uh, I got another film here you can look at. It's going to show you an overview. Now, I have a company called Raising the Arts. And in Raising the Arts, we create pieces for nonprofit organizations to assist them with raising funds. I found out a while back that rather than me waiting for people to contact me for a commission, that I could actually reach out to people to do a commission. That was part of my sign painting hustle. I used to walk past a Chinese store, a Chinese food store, look at the signs, walk into the place and say, I can't read your sign. What does it say? And I said, I can send a guy back tomorrow to fix that sign. And the person behind the counter will go send him tomorrow. I was short with my lettering brush, knock that sign out and get paid. Well, I turned that same paradigm into me and commissions. Most artists wait for commissions. I don't. I go to corporations and nonprofit organizations. I give them proposals and I say, let me do this. Let's partner on this. And this has produced 70 commissions across the United States for me going to them. Now, I'm not saying all of my commissions come that way, but I'm telling you more than 75% of my commissions was me selling myself to the client. And this is an example of some of those commissions. Thank you.
So as you can see, um, I, I take I do a lot of work. So that's a that's a portion of the commission works that I've done. Um, just to give you a flavor of how much work. See now, when I started this whole process, I tried to ex explain to you the importance of repetition, the importance of doing sketching, the importance of doing studies, the importance of putting yourself out there. But what I also want you to track is how much work you've seen just in these few presentations. Okay. I do a lot of work and I'm not bragging about the work. It's about the process. Too many artists are now trying to find a style rather than letting the style find them. Too many artists are trying to get to a destination without wanting to do the journey. Okay. The journey as a visual artist and uh, Paul Goodnight phrased it perfectly. We're image makers. That's our responsibility to capture the truth in whatever we're trying to do. And so if you take that responsibility, see hobbyists draw pictures and, and they're pretty pictures. Is a difference between a hobbyist and a professional artist. There's a difference between a hobbyist and an aspiring artist. An aspiring artist is simply now making the commitment to start having a word and a voice in their work. A hobbyist just does what they want to do and color by numbers and put it on the wall and do 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 do. If that's who you want to be, fine. It's nothing wrong with that. I'm not judging any of it because all of it's designed for you to get therapy anyway. Artists and right brain thinkers are only put on this planet to see the world different, to express themselves different, to communicate different. That's it. God only gave us this talent to keep us from going crazy. In a nutshell, so we're all part of the same family. But I do take the discipline aspect of the journey to be very, very important and probably more important than the monetary side of it. Despite all the things I've shown you, I've not yet talked about money. I've talked about the desire. I talked about the persistence. I talked about other things. But there are more to um, your forward movement than the monetary gains. Some artists right now are more concerned about fame than they are about building a portfolio. I was invited, I, I am invited to some of the top colleges in the country to do portfolio reviews of students and been doing that pretty steadily since I started in business. I am now my, in my 40th year as a professional artist and my 35th year in the art business. I'm not claiming to know everything, but I can tell you I've seen a lot. When I look at the average student's portfolio, it's like a psychic reading because I can tell you about yourself by looking at how you draw. I can tell by how many pictures you do, how many um, blank pages are in your portfolio, what levels of completion, who signs work, who doesn't sign work, who is a perfectionist, who's not a perfectionist, who is a perfectionist to their own detriment. These are the things I can read in a portfolio just from watching it and having students pass through. And often when I do that, they are spooked because they're wondering how I'm able to answer certain things. The one thing I spent time and dedicated my life to is the fact that I am an artist advocate. I am a sharer. My teacher, Chanel Alford, the guy I introduced you to at the beginning of this presentation, he made me come back to my high school every year to share with the students what I was learning in college. He saw me as to be the first kid in a long time who went to college for art and that I had a responsibility to come back and share with the kids. So mentorship was a part of my life from the very, very beginning stages of me as an artist. And I do believe to this day is one of the pillars on my foundation that's leading to my success is that I've literally helped and mentored hundreds of artists on every level, not just aspiring, even mid-career, and I even colleague with masters. So that is our job as artists, is not to hone in and hoard the information and hoard our work. See, some artists are working for themselves, and that's their biggest problem. Art was not intended for you to do it for yourself. God didn't intend for you to paint and put them on your walls and harbor them, and, oh, I don't want to sell that one. For what? He meant for you to share it by any means necessary. And see, when you're creating, you're using one half of the circle. You're having fun, you're vibing, you're learning a few things, but you're doing it for yourself. The moment you complete the circle is when you share your work. You start connecting with people. You start letting your life have a work of its own. That is what the creative circle looks like. So some of y'all stay in here with the half of the circle. And I'm not mad at you because it's developmental things that's going to happen to you as an artist. But my advice to you is don't say on half of the circle. The world needs to see what you have to say. So I'm going to move to another part of my presentation. 
um, as you can see, I'm, I'm trying to let you get a bigger overview of what my work looks like, okay? Uh, along the way, um, I'm gonna show you another short video. It's not gonna take much time, but it's gonna show you uh, some of my original work. Now, this is a cross section. You'll notice that in my original works, you're gonna find some things that are, have not been shown in uh, some of the other videos that I've shown you because I want you to also get a gander of what's happening with uh, the quantity of work that I create. I think that I, I don't wanna lean on that, but I want you guys to really understand part of the journey and the journey of creativity is huge. So you, as you can see, the original section I just showed you shows two-dimensional works, three-dimensional works, pieces that have realism. Some, some things have photography in them. I just entered the realm of doing some digital work, but not a lot of it. Most of the work you see is collaging and hand painting, but I'm now moving into this new phase of doing some digital work. Ex Art is about exploration. You're not stuck in one place. You know, you got some artists that have one style. They do that one style rep repetitively and they do well. I am not a one style artist. I'm a multidiscipline artist. So I use different medium. I love dry mediums. I love pencil, charcoal. I love pen and ink. I love oil. I love acrylic. But my chosen medium is acrylic because I can make acrylic look like several different things. Again, I have some health concerns in my own studio. So naturally, I want to try to do as many wet mediums as I can or things that are not um, toxic. So I wanted to show you that original section so you can get a better idea of some of the things that I'm vibing on here in my studio. Okay, so you, you see as, I, as we get into this whole conversation, I'm really starting to talk about things that stretch your imagination and things that you can utilize to make you a better artist. A better artist is one that's full of exploration and that's really what I try to do with my work. You know, this next thing I'm gonna show you is gonna be some photography work. Now, outside of me being a graphic designer, 
by trade. I also uh, study photography as a minor. I love photography. I do it on the side. Most of the pieces that I do are, I, I stopped using references that pre-exist and started shooting my own references. And that's how I really fell into photography. One thing that's really important about the work that I've shown you so far is that I would say at least 80% of my work is from my imagination. In other words, I do not use photographic studies for a lot of the, the stylized works that I do. In that sketchbook that I showed you a little bit earlier, that sketchbook, the, the criteria for the sketchbook was I had to come up from my imagination with these drawings. They had to be 15 minutes, 20 minutes max, only for imagination, no sources. I say that because not a lot of artists now are using their imagination. They're using sources and they're trying to use technology and sources and they're, they're using this as a reference and that as a reference and, and they're not creating their own references. You heard Charlie yesterday say he's been shooting his own photography. Well, I think when you are a complete artist, you're using all of the mediums. I also sculpt, I use clay, I use wood. Um, but I wanted you to see in the original section some of the other things that I work with. But right now, I'm going to give you a little small rundown of what I have done in my photography work. So in my photography, I try to capture and and challenge standards of beauty. Okay, so you know we've been told that if you're tall, you're thin, you're white, you're blonde, you're blue-eyed, you 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 you're 99 pounds, that that's a standard of beauty, and it's not a standard of beauty. 
uh, the women that I shot in that whole series of photographs are art. All of them are artists. Most of them would care not to be in front of the camera. And so that's the kind of stuff that I like, I'm challenged by. You know, I, I think that that duality is very interesting. And, 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 it, and, and there's a beauty in us and uh, us appreciating our individual beauty. And so these things that I jump in between, whether it be sculpture, whether it be illustration, whether it be photography, are, they round me out as an artist and they keep me stimulated to the point of really trying to explore different things and different ways to interpret the things that I paint. And I think that each artist could, you know, we could do a little better with stretching ourselves. If you're now using, still using photographs and book references or Googling all your images for your subject matter, Understand that there is some ethics involved. When you copy a photograph and you interpret it for yourself, you are not really being an artist. You're not, you're borrowing something else. And I'm not saying artists don't borrow, artists borrow all the time, but you wanna strive to have your own imagery. Take, take your camera and shoot a, a, your own face and use that as a reference before you choose a famous photograph in a magazine and make that your baseline for your painting. Because no matter what you do to that painting to make it yours, it's still not yours. And oh, guess what? I know at least three artists that have been sued for doing renditions of famous photographs where the photographer took them to court for copyright infringement. So you gotta start looking at the business and the ethics of how you create your images. I've always been that way, but as I move further into my career, I find different sources for my work, but now working for imagination is powerful because nobody can take that away from you. And shooting my own references become a way that I can keep that creative realm kind of closer to me rather than having it go away. And so I see a lot of artists that do a lot of different things. Computer uh, uh, illustration and computer graphics is very interesting because you get a chance to fuse a lot of things together. But I still believe that same principle is true. I would rather you shoot your own references than to take references that pre-exist. It's easier to do that. Everybody's in Google. Everybody's got a folder in Pinterest. I know how it works, y'all. But I, after a while, it gets tired. And it, and it speaks to your own level of creativity. So I want to get back to the presentation so you guys can see what's going on. Uh, as I told you, um, photography is one of my sources. Um, but I also got into doing a clothing line. Now, let me explain to you how the clothing line thing happened, because it's, it's actually kind of funny. So I was sitting in a restaurant with a bunch of artists and we were talking about projects we wanted to do. And I said, uh, in the circle of artists, I said, I want to do some poncho ponchos with my artwork on them. And everybody, it was about five of us. Everybody broke out giggling and laughing. I figured it was funny. I, I giggled and laughed with them. I said, maybe that's a whack idea. But I later thought about it and I said, you know what? I, I'm going to see if I can find me somebody to create a line of ponchos for me. And guess what, y'all? I'm the one laughing. See, you got to not admit, if you, when you get an idea, y'all, and I want you to write this down. When you get an idea, it's not just yours. The creator is sending and filtering things to you all the time. Your brain is a sponge. So you don't know how your brain is going to merge the things you saw, the things you were inspired from, the things other artists did to make it to your canvas. But you have to be an open vessel to let that process happen without putting yourself in a box. Okay? So... That's what happened with my clothing line. They, they laughed at me. I found a company that could do them. This is the uh, this is what happened as a result of me coming up with this. And then the funny thing about it was once I created it and it was called a poncho, nobody else wanted to do ponchos.
sorry about that. Uh, that's part of my clothing line. And that's to let you know there's more than one way for you to utilize your artwork. I'm a, a big advocate of licensing. And I probably do more licensing than most people. I've done calendars, figurines, you name it, T-shirt lines, all kinds of other stuff that contain art. I'm also right now currently signed for a company called Shades Calendar that has produced many products of my work over the last five years. Every artist should explore ways to get their work out there. You know what? Uh, people used to always ask me, hey, Larry, uh, how many museums are you in? I'm like, well, I'm in about four or five, but let me explain something to you. With the movement that went down in 1985 to 2005, known as the golden age of African-American art, art was selling in the millions. It went into millions and millions and millions of homes from 1985 to 2005. I am blessed to have my work in 500,000 homes. And I had a, slate, a statement or a slogan long before that where somebody asked me about how many museums I was in. And I told them point blank, I'd rather be in 500,000 homes than one museum. I've chosen which gang I belong to, and I'm going to maximize that as far as I can. Artists now are experiencing all kinds of crossovers in business. So just because you're in one uh, part of the business now doesn't mean you can't make a crossover. And, and guys like Charlie Palmer are proving that every day. And so you need to really perfect your work, keep putting your work out. People ask me, what can I do to do? And not work. It's simple, work. It doesn't cost you anything. And it's going to benefit you. It's going to benefit you in your spirit first because you'll be um, content with who you are. But finding who you are is that point where you open yourself up. Because painting is like a diary. It's part. It's, it's very personal until you're able to throw that diary in somebody's lap and say, I hope you get something out of it. And that's what we need to start doing with our work is throwing it on some people's laps and letting them get something out of it. The world needs what we do. At this particular time of all the things that are happening in this world, historically, politically, and otherwise, black art and art in general is the thing that has, makes all of life beautiful and it makes all of life have a meaning. And, and, and it's just it speaks volumes to the power of art, music and dance. I am uh, honored to be one of the people that's an image maker and you should be honored to be an image maker, too. So I'm going to get ready to start wrapping up this presentation, but I got a couple more things I want to show you before we get out of here. Um, you know, um, I, I encourage you all to ask questions. You know, uh, part of when I came up, I had no role models in place. Nobody could show me the path. Now, this is some highlights. This is just one highlight. This car is an example of my past meeting me in my future. There's an artist by the name of um, Salvador Scarpita. He's a, a very well-known Italian artist. I met him when I was 19 years old, 19 years old. I was in the height of my lettering days when I met this artist. Look him up. You will find him. He is a very prolific artist. This car was painted by me in the early 80s. If you see on the side fin, it says paint by Larry Poncho Brown. At the time he commissioned me to paint this car, um, he was asking me all these bizarre things to add to this car. I want a dog. I want a steak. I want a bazooka. I, want it. I just did everything he asked me to do, not realizing that time. I didn't know that he was a world-renowned artist. Recently, a couple of years ago, I got a call from the Hershorn Museum in Washington, D.C., the Sculpture Garden. They had done a retrospective of Mr. Scarpita's work, and guess which was the central feature of that exhibition? How would I know that a job I did when I was 18 years old will be held in one of the highest sculpture um, museums in the country? You never know where your work is going to end up. You just got to keep working. And I tell you, the more work you do, the more advocates you have out there for the future things that's going to be coming your way. And so um, that's important, y'all. I don't know what else to say about that. So I got some questions. Somebody asked me, what's new, Poncho? What's new? So this is what's new, y'all. I'm going to show you some of the things that I, um, not, not just a couple of them. It's something you got to see. This is my latest project. Um, um, LED Baltimore decided to do a display of my work for one and a half weeks here in Baltimore. I'm going to show you that first. No, I'm sorry. This is what I'm going to do first. We all are going to um, talk about um, there's some new things on the horizon for me. And I want to explain the new things that are on the horizon for me. I'm getting ready to move into the realm of virtual reality. 
and augmented reality with my work. And this is one of the first projects I worked on to give you an idea of what that looks like. This is a 3D representation of my studio. This technology is something that I'm studying now. I'm trying to figure out ways to do virtual displays and virtual exhibitions based on the time that we're in right now. So this is a 3D version of my studio. So as you can see, I'm trying to press the boundaries of what I can learn in the realm of streaming, uh, virtual presentations, virtual exhibitions. In that particular uh, uh, um, video I just showed you, that is online. 
you can go online and you can actually put on virtual uh, uh, glasses and watch that whole thing and be in my studio. So I'm working on different ways to display work. We're at a time now where all galleries and exhibition houses, pop-up galleries and such have to find ways to show virtual presentations. So that's an area that I'm trying to really explore. Uh, my last thing I'm going to show you for today is my my last uh, project that I worked on. And this is uh, something that was really exciting because I had never seen my work uh, quite displayed this way. I hope you will enjoy this. And then I'm going to open up the floor for questions and answers. This is a project I did with LED Baltimore. Um, it was a wonderful opportunity for me to show my works uh, in a different form. So I hope you'll enjoy this video. So that's what I'm working on new, y'all. I'm always trying to find new media to, to show my work and to, um, to share my work. And I hope you guys gathered a little bit from uh, my approach to doing my work. It's about sharing. It's about taking responsibility for be, being an image maker. And I encourage you all to step your game up. I, I, look, I say that not as an insult to you, but I do it every day. I'm always trying to step my game up. I think all artists now are at a point now where they realize we have to become more business people. We were right-brained people and for the longest time, left-brained people were ruling us. And now we're being forced to utilize our left brain. And so it's wonderful for me to see people like Louise Cutler now taking on doing art festivals. We've been talking about a day when artists will be starting to do their own events almost two decades ago and to see her moving that way and representing herself as an artist, as a woman artist, is very, very important. So if you guys have any questions, you can please channel that through to Louise Cutler. I'm going to bring her back in the screen so we can chit chat a little bit in case she's got some questions she wants to ask me. I see we got Paul Goodnight that's going to be coming on soon. But if you have any questions, please post them now and I'll address any questions that you have. Hey, Louise, where are you? That's right. She's coming in soon. Any questions you have, you feel free to post them. I'll be willing to answer any questions that you do have. I'm going to highlight some of the things you guys said online, too. Hey! <laughs> You are muted.
I'll just, while she's getting set, I'm going to go ahead and answer a couple of these questions. Prompt how do you feel about making your own custom canvas for painting? Okay, yeah, yeah, that's good. Do you want me to move it back some more? Uh, Omar, I, I, I love, I, I love custom canvases, but I created such a pace right now that it's very, very difficult for me to, to do my canvases. I would love to get to a point where I could stretch all of my canvases like I did back in the day. Uh, but right now, um, I produce work at such a rapid rate. I don't have time to really do that. So I do buy most of my canvases. Does anybody else have any questions out there in cyberspace? That's right, Sandra Davis. It does help you explore the concept. That's very important to me. I think that's the thing I want artists to, to what, what information I want to impart to other artists is taking that part very seriously. Uh, on the eight and a half by 11 sketches, they normally take me um, sometimes 10, 15 minutes. Remember now in my sketchbook, my criteria for my sketchbook was 10 to 15 minutes. So naturally when I'm doing other sketches, I work very fast because I'm so used to working in that fashion. Um, each one of the sketches took 15, 20 minutes tops. Well, thank you, Sandra. Uh, whew, Karen Buster would have to ask me, how many pieces do I create in a month? Uh, put it this way. You have some artists that work all year round, like Charlie Palmer. And then you have pre artists that work seasonally, like Larry Poncho Brown. I work seasonally. So that means I might paint six months out of the year. But in six months, I can get up to 150 to 200 pieces done in a year. And so I get a lot of pieces done in a year, but it really depends on the cycle of the year. I do a creative quarantine every January since 2006, where I lock myself in my studio to create. So in January alone, I created 60 pieces. Yes. Any other questions? Thank you, Lynn. I'm glad you took time to go see the display. For those of you that didn't see the display, you can go to my Facebook page and you can actually see what's happening on that Facebook page. Uh, if you don't have any other questions, I think I'm going to turn it over to Louise, who is having some sound problems because she's still muted. We can't hear you, Louise. Hey, Omar, I'm going to answer Omar's question. How important is it to buy expensive medium brushes, supplies, et cetera, for a painting? Um, you know what? I want artists to get out of this habit of talking about how expensive supplies are. That is a, a brain locking circumstance. Once you find what works for you, paint lasts a long time. You can make a painting last for as long as you want it to last. So Let's get out of this mindset of artwork being and supplies being expensive. It's not true. Um, especially when you count into to take into effect what you're actually selling your pieces for. So if you're still talking about the cost of supplies, you're probably stuck in one particular phase of your development. And so I, I implore you to get out of that phase. It's the price of what you got to do to be in this business. Get the supplies you need house them, take care of them. I have brushes that I've had for 10, 15 years, you know, and supplies, I don't look at that as a cost or an expense. I look at it as an investment. So can you hear me now? Louise, you're unmuted. Yes, we can hear you now. Oh, good. Okay, so. But it's a, uh, it's, it's, but it's a, it's a weird delayed response. Oh, well, I was, I was just telling you, you're being invaded. We got Paul Goodnight and Charlie Palmer in the room <laughs> and they're coming to hang out with you, not me. So I'm going to bring them in and let you guys have some space. <laughs> hey, Hello, Paul. Charlie Palmer. And hey, hey, Black man. I'm, I'm sorry to, to join so lately. I mean, late. I've been running around all day, but I'm glad to catch the tail end of this. Not uh, I, I, I learned something. This seasonal thing, man, that's fascinating to me. I, I need to learn more about the seasonal thing. 
Well, the seasonal thing comes because I have ADD. (laughs) (laughs) And you know I'm split between, right? Like I listened to your presentation yesterday and you made it very clear that you are about business. You have a circle around you to handle other things so you can focus on art. I happen to get part of my creative motivation from selling and marketing. So when I'm not doing art, I'm doing marketing. And, And each phase feeds the other. So when I'm laying dormant, and I'm doing my marketing, it feeds into when I'm getting ready to start doing my work. So, I mean, everybody works different and I wanna make sure that artists know that it's not one or two ways to work. Right. Okay, 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 all right. Uh, you know, and, and to follow up with that, like what I'm curious about is what happens in those moments when it's the off season and the business part, but you're inspired. At that time you do create, right? Or do you postpone it? And can, and can no. you do that? No, sketchbook. Okay. Sketchbook. Okay. I, I live by a sketchbook. I have a sketchbook in the bathroom. I have a sketchbook by my bedside. <laughs> oh, the, you look and laugh, but we all got our techniques. Uh-huh. A sketchbook in my bathroom and a sketchbook by my bed. So when okay. I wake up and I have ideas, I put them in the sketchbook. When I'm in the bathroom, which is real meditative time, mm-hmm. I may do two or three sketches of an idea in the bathroom. So by the time I get to my creative season, those sketches are the first things on my drawing table. Got it. Okay. Because I, I also feel like it's easy for me to delegate certain responsibilities to people. But if I don't have an understanding how certain things fit, then I, I think I'm at a slight disadvantage. So um, I kind of I kind of balance between the two. Got it. All right. So can you hear me now? Am I still a delayed response? Um, Are you, am I in now? Yeah, you have a 20 You're second in. delay. OK, well, I'm just going to have to have that. So, Paul, say hi. There's Paul. Hey, <laughs> hey Paul. How you doing, Paul? Hey, Paul. How you doing, man? What's up, my brothers? <laughs> you know how we do the dap? That's right. <laughs> and I, I want to get in on the dap, too. Oh, this is exciting. I made that up. I forgot that. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, you're always forgetting I'm in the room. I, no, I haven't forgotten. <laughs> I, I just don't re- always remember what words to choose. <laughs> oh, okay. I know. I know. So, Paul, I see you got some stuff back there. You got something to show? I got a couple of pieces that I'm working on here. Mm-hmm. And you want me to talk about those? If you can, you can talk about them. I got uh, I, Charlie came in to visit with you and Poncho's here. Yeah. And there was a couple of people that we're like, when? Oh, somebody said, oh my God. I think it was Gail that was waiting for you to come. So there's Gail. She's excited that you're here. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, oh, my boy said I'm overrated. <laughs> you over what? <laughs> you're overrated? Yes. Yeah, I have let, I'm just going to pull Kenny up and tell him to hold on a minute. I got Kenny. Kenny's one of our hosts. Hi, Kenny. I know you're one of our hosts. We got a special surprise with Paul Goodnight and Charlie Palmer. So I'm going to have you come up in a minute, okay? His name is Kenny? Uh, yeah, Kenny's got some music for us. So Kenny's going to come up and, and, and play some music for us in a minute. All right, Kenny, I'll call you up in a few minutes. His All name, right. His name is Kenny? Uh, Kenneth. Kenny. Oh, Kenny. Kenny. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, what did he say? What he did he say? I thought you said skinny. Oh, so <laughs> no, Kenny, Kenny, Paul. Well, we're, we we were uh, we're waiting for some of those pearls of wisdom that I keep hearing uh, everybody talks about. Talk about we call good night. Oh, yeah, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I hear there's some, some you, pearls of you wisdom know, in that. In, in, in all seriousness, those pearls come down through me from someone else. It's not my, it's not my, it's not, it's, it's words from the commander on high. Oh. <laughs> they passed, he's passed on, but he's allowed me to talk about him and through him. What is Charlie over there drinking? That's all I want to know. Huh? No. <laughs> What'd you say? no, what yeah. do you got yeah. back there? Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, I don't think Charlie realized we can see everything he's doing. <laughs> I know I said it as 
ladies night and happy hour, but Paul is act I mean, uh Charlie's taking it serious. <laughs> so <laughs> all right, Paul, what you got over there to show us? Let me um, see. Well, I'm I'm actually working on a few things, but the things that are in behind me is uh this one here, you know, just just the preface just a little bit. I really feel as though we have the obligation to talk about something that's bothering us in our neighborhood and what uh, vehicle do we have is basically our expression through art, through the visual means. And I think we have to participate every once in a while in order to show ourselves that we want to help clean up the neighborhood as well as we know that the image carries a lot of weight and it goes on a long, long time. So he basically, who defines the image, controls the mind, as they used to say. So we have to just start drawing and painting different narratives. And you you know, you have a lot of different moods. So this one is just another mood. Um, I'll go back to maybe fantasizing. I'll go back to uh, musicians and sports and stuff, as well as I, you know, I never forget my sensuality because I don't want to lock it away. I have to express it and put it on a canvas so um, I don't mess around. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the piece that I have here is called um, Take a Knee. And if you, if you look at this, there's Colin Kaepernick taking a knee and he lost his job. And then there's that policeman who stood, I don't know if you can see that, who uh, kneeled on George Floyd's knee, uh, head. And obviously he's taken a knee and someone lost their life. So one lost their job, the other one lost their life. And they're really talking about, Colin Kaepernick was talking about the exact same thing that the police is doing. So the visual, is something that you really want to emphasize. I haven't finished it. I'm just still working on the piece. But I, I, I think the visual is take a knee. Then what is this all about? And I said, this is exactly what it's all about. This is what Colin Kaepernick got fired for. And there was a brother even before Colin Kaepernick, i have forgotten his name, who took a knee and, and also suffered the same kind of slings that Colin Kaepernick did. It's just that Colin Kaepernick did it a little bit more publicly and uh, then lose his life. The other brother almost lost his life, almost committed suicide because they were harassing him. And this one, and so that's what this is about. It's really, it says take a knee. The flag is in the background, but the flag had nothing to do with what these two gentlemen were doing. And I use the word gentlemen on the policemen very loosely. So that's one of the things that did. And you know, I like to enter interact the two images so you'll see uh images kind of ghost-like in front of uh, other images i like the transparencies and i made the the policeman very very dark and there's a light that that's shining through uh colin kaepernick's afro that's going to beam throughout this so i'm continually building this up i don't always know where i'm going but I'm always, I know that I'm being led in the right direction. So I, it, it's about having all these tools and to be able to learn to use these tools and to challenge yourself, never feel comfortable with the tools that you have. So this is just another way of challenging myself and making the statement. I hope that wasn't too long. <laughs> no, these are words of wisdom. Folks don't get mm -hmm. a chance to hear um not only how we think, but to hear how our masters think. Uh oh, now see, now that's the whole thing about mastery. The masters really, I mean, sometimes it really, you know, it sounds a, a lot more uh, um, uh, royal than it really is. Mastery is really about uh, uh, the skill development. You know, you do things over and over and over and over again, like a sketchbook poncho. You know, <laughs> I got that dig. <laughs> I heard somebody does sketchbooks on his off time. <laughs> but the, I actually do sketch. I was 
was I was taught, you know, um, the, from the old schools, but I was also really blossomed when I got in touch with the group called the NCA. These were bunches of artists, and uh, these were artists that were touchable, but they were actually figures that we were supposed to you know, follow, because they, they weren't playing around. I mean, I was doing art because I, I really liked the opposite sex. <laughs> and I figured that this was one talent, maybe they'll like me if I do this, you know what I mean? We all do it for a reason, we're all growing up. But I wasn't serious about it, what I'm trying to say. And the NCA, these brothers and sisters were very serious. I think in the, in the early 20s and 30s, the most of the artists were doing very narrative work. You know, they, they were talking about a time and a place, maybe a, a better place. If you look at Charles White's book, there's a lot of um, uh, political things and, high, and highly developed pieces that uh, you would think that these people weren't thinking about that. But see, art, you have to be honest with. I mean, I don't care where you else you lie, you drive and ticket, all that other kind of stuff. But you have to be honest to use the gifts that you have. And if I'm not honest anywhere else, I'm definitely honest in, in doing this because it's my voice. Uh, I think we all love to be a, able to express themselves and to have an audience. Peace is not finished until you have somebody else to tell their story through your work. And it's really interesting sometimes this, the piece is no longer mine. Uh, it's the person whose story is better than mine. <laughs> so I said, yeah, I think I'll use that. But it is the idea of this whole development. I mean, mastery, I think that's where I, I got off a little bit. Mastery is mastering the either the technique or um, a, a, a certain materials like a medium you know, like uh, pen and ink, you know, whatever that is, that's mastery. But that's only a tool that you put in your tool book bo box in order that you can pull it out when you have to be skillful. But then the rest is your imagination. And that's the thing that you follow. And that's one of the ways that I understood that don't, don't like, in, they don't interfere. Because I was telling Pantry yesterday, I think, I said, art doesn't move. It's supposed to move you. And when it moves you, when it challenges you, when it entertains you, and if you can put all of that in one painting, you got a masterpiece because then that is a culmination of all of what you've learned and all of what you've allowed yourself to learn. Mm -hmm. And that is really, uh, that's really when you're being, being, being uh, full. That's what that the other thing it's like art does not define me art fulfills me that's a real big difference mm -hmm. so that's why i do it all the time um i mean I, it, especially as you get older <laughs> not too much else you can do well you know what paul is that's that's my point and i understand and i really appreciate you separating out mastery and master the term master is a it's like a heading that people use. The reason why I said master is because we had Elizabeth Catlett, Jacob Lauren, Vinnie Andrews, and a host of other people who have preceded us. We have a new art generation of artists that are moving into that place. Mm -hmm. so I'm speaking of you not as a master or to talk about mastery in, which, in, in your abilities because all artists kneel to who, who you and your abilities. But the reality is we have a new group of masters moving into the position to fulfill the places of Elizabeth Catlin and them. And, and, and I'm telling you, whether you feel it or not, your colleagues have you in that position. Oh, thank you. <laughs> It's kind of embarrassing because I don't, you know, you don't see yourself as other people see you. You know, you're just, uh, I'm just on this journey. You're yeah. on this journey, Paul, but I, and, and, and you're very humble and we all learn from your humble nature. But when we make a list of the top five artists in our community right now, and it's representing what we do, that come from the area because you were commercially successful and now you're just as successful on the fine art realm of the business. Your name is still 
amongst the tops of those names of the living legends. So maybe we should call you, I don't know which one you would feel comfortable with, but just the notion that you are being here and sharing your time with us and your wisdom, because your wisdom means something to each of us. I've been doing this 40 years and I still look up to every word that you say. Real? Every word? Oh, every word. Trouble. Every word. You know, like Including the curse words. <laughs> so, can you hear me now? Uh, do it again, Louise. Can you hear me now? You are in real time for the first time. <laughs> so I had to swap out. I swapped out. I, my uh, my headphones. I was using my AirPods, and they wouldn't disconnect. So after we'll that, be glad you figured that out, darling. <laughs> well, I'm just pleased to be able to uh, be in the presence of such greatness. I'm just going to tell you, um, you guys have been um, just. I don't know, uh, people that I have wanted to meet and people that other artists have wanted to meet. And I know a lot of times you don't feel like you're at a certain place. And I like uh, Charlie was talking about, I'm like I have created my masterpiece, but billions of other people may have thought that at some point, but um, you guys are at the, you know, for most of us artists, you're at the top of the chain that we're trying to get to. And so it's really um, helpful and a blessing to be able to be here with you guys and hear the struggle. Uh, because like you said, Poncho, a lot of artists think that Zap, you're at the at the top. I wanna get to where Poncho is. I wanna get to where Charlie is. I wanna get to where Paul Goodnight is. But they don't, they never have seen the struggle. They don't see the struggle. It's almost, it's the grass is greener on the other side. But like you said, a lot of young artists don't want to do the work that goes into getting to that other side of the grass. And so I I am honored. I mean, I'm literally honored to glean from the fruit of all of you all because that's what I feel like it is. It's like being able to pick from this fruit and this fruit and this fruit and then take that fruit and ingest it. I was telling somebody the other day, I said, uh, uh, Paul is seasoned. And when you're, what happened, when you, I mean, honestly, I got a but, <laughs> but what happens when you put, what happens when you put something under season? It's, it gets a, it gets a flavor. It's like you use seasoning for flavor. And so, uh, I, you know, a lot of times we get rid of all of our, um, uh, sort of, uh, older people because we're it's the new generation we're this and we're that and then we miss out on that knowledge and that impartation because there is an impartation that happens that will that that the only way you can move forward is if you get that impartation and if you don't get that impartation then it's hard to move forward so if you don't uh respect the older uh, older people or the seasoned people or those people that have been there and gone before, then you end up making mistakes that you don't have to make and falling into traps you don't have to fall into. And, and, and it's like, it's not that you don't work, you have to work, but you learn that, oh, he didn't get there just by, by chance. He got there from hard work. It's like Pancho was saying, you know, it, it takes hard work. So how would you, you know, just sharing about that portion of it. I know you shared a little bit, uh, Charlie, and you did too, Poncho, but just sharing that, because these are different people, just sharing that part of it, because a lot of uh, artists just figure, hey, I'm gonna get to where you guys are, but how do you get there? There, I, I don't think there's a, a one path. I, I, I think it really, I was very lucky. I learned that I needed like four or five things in my life to keep me on this journey. So, I mean, yeah, there is, there's a lot of, you know, in anything that you do, there's going to be obstacles. It depends on how much do you really need to express yourself. It really comes down to self-expression. I was fortunate because I met with, you know, like Charles White and the Biggers and the Catlets and all of these people who were really driven. You know, I never seen that before. <laughs> so these people were not playing. 
And that told me that this is, you know, what you're made for. I told Charlie and I told Pontius the story about the ham and egg sandwich, and I won't repeat it unless you want to hear it. But the reality repeat is. It. Tell me, tell it. Tell me, tell it. Yeah, repeat it. Repeat it. it. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Jeez. Yeah, no, it's important. <laughs> There was, John Davis had a show here in Boston. Just talk a little louder, though. Okay, John, okay. I'm sorry, I raised my head. <laughs> <laughs> like, that was going to be a little louder. Um, John Vegas had a show here in Boston at the Museum of Fine Arts. And I believe, because he and I would talk back and forth over the phone, he would keep me keep me focused. And he, he would... And, and, and a lot of people were trying to get his attention, and I wanted it. So I said, John, I need you to come by and see my artwork. Uh, he said, okay, Paul. And then he went back and talked to the people. I said, oh, hell no. I said, John, would, when are you going to come by and see my artwork? He said, soon, Paul. And I said, wait a minute. And he, is it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? I was getting a little, the tidy in his face. And he said, let me ask you a question. Are you committed or are you involved? I said, John, you know doggone well I'm committed. We talk about art. Why do we do it? Who do we do it for? Where's our inspiration? He said, that's all I need to know, Paul. Says, because it's like a ham and egg sandwich. You do understand, don't you? Sir? I shook my head yes, and then I shook my head no because I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. <laughs> And he said, in a ham and egg sandwich, the chicken who laid the egg was involved, but the pig was committed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. He yeah. said, be the pig, Paul, I'll see your work, and so won't the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. I said, damn, John, that's the first time I enjoyed being called a pig. <laughs> <laughs> But but that's what that's how he taught. That's why I say mentorship is really really important because they keep you on the track. The second one would be a great teacher. I had a great teacher. He was a Renaissance teacher, Paul Healy, but he had a great sense of humor and he made me work. And I'm going to school now trying to take sculpture so I can learn that craft all over again. So a good mentor, a good teacher, uh, a good advocate, and that's what we all are. You know, I'm an advocate for Charlie. I'm an advocate for Pancho. Pancho is an advocate for me. This is why I'm on here now. But that's that. That's the broader thing. And then the other one, and I realize you have a loving family. That's that goes without saying. But the other one is to have comrades. You know, yep. people who are working in your field, so you can bounce shit off of them, and they mm -hmm. can do the exact same thing to you. And then I'm getting young people who I'm working with. And they're challenging me, so I love, I love that interaction, and because it can be a very isolating proposition when you're just sitting in your own studio by yourself and you're just working or loafing or do whatever you're doing. And when you have somebody that's motivating you, some young person, then you know you need to get to work, and and you have dialogue with them. And I have art sessions here. Uh, where people can just come in on one day out of a, uh, two days out of a month and just draw. I got two funny Paul Goodnight stories. Oh, shit. Okay. Let's hear them. okay. <laughs> the first funny good, uh, Paul Goodnight story, and it's not really funny. I shouldn't have said funny. Oh, when I had my fire in 1995, funny. I'm going to make the last one funny. The first one was serious. No, the first no. experience I had to show you the, the humility of this man is that when I had my fire in 1995, oh. Paul Goodnight sent me a check and his mailing list to mm. start it again. Oh, wow. He also oh. sent me a sketchbook, which I still owe him today. Okay? That's part of the funny story. But I want you to hear the first part. He talked about camaraderie. Paul Goodnight sent me a check and a mailing list at one of my lowest points. Oh. Now, the funny story is I'm walking in the Million Man March. I leave my son home in case there's going to be mischief. Me and a bunch of my boys go to the Million Man March. I'm walking through the crowd. Who do I see? 
Paul Goodnight. What is overall on? He, he came up to me. We spoke. He says, hey, Poncho. And I say, hey, Paul, what you doing here, man? You enjoying this? He says, Poncho, do you have $2? <laughs> and I was stunned. Like, oh, he must be joking. So I reach in my pocket. I give him the $2. Two, the $2. Paul Goodnight disappears in the crowd of a <laughs> I never knew what the two dollars was for. And of out of a million people, he was the person I bumped into. <laughs> oh man. Oh, man. Good one. Oh, out of the big crowd, Paul Goodnight two dollars from me. Oh, Pancho, you got a better memory than me. <laughs> That's a good one. Oh man, well, that's pretty funny. Never, never found out what the two dollars was for. Never. <laughs> you yeah. know, you know what, you know what story I thought you were going to tell. Remember when we were down in Brazil? In Brazil, and, yes. And I jumped in the water and it started swimming and swimming and swimming, and Michael Brown walked up behind me. Tap me on the back like I thought I was really out there. <laughs> I I was gone nowhere. Uh, we are uh, one thing people don't know about artists is their extra life. Me and Paul Goodnight and another phenomenal artist, Michael Brown and Frank Frazier, did an art project in Brazil. Now they brought us into Brazil to do this event where it was going to be an exchange with the artists that were in Brazil. But they reneged on some of their responsibilities, so we decided to make it into a vacation. <laughs> and uh, Charles, I mean, what we didn't know is that Paul Goodnight speaks Portuguese. Mm. Ah. We also didn't know that Paul Goodnight has spent a lot of time in Brazil, and that leads to my third funny story of Paul Goodnight. Oh, Jesus. No. Every night when we would meet for dinner, Paul Goodnight would show up like a magician out of nowhere he would sit with us he would take a little bite off of everybody's plate and he would disappear like he did when i saw him at the million man march so those are my three or four paul goodnight funny stories <laughs> Charlie, you gonna have, you gonna have to send us some something to drink too if you gonna keep that up. You know well, what? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm slowing you it down. You said it was ladies' night, so we just playing along. It's ladies' night, ladies' night. Let's we got ladies here. There's Valerie and Karen. Who else is on? What other ladies are on? Shout out, ladies! Shout out. There was a question. Hold on. Um, let me see. What did Valerie say? Thank you for. This for this important how understanding that I, I have in all my walls I've been married for years. Oh wow! Um, Thank you, Ver Valerie Summers, for for that statement. Yeah, Valerie has been great. Oh, she wanted to ask, what did you this one? What do you think about this? Uh, the uh, for selling? Are you guys? Uh, I know, Paul. You're you're jumping on the virtual bandwagon. You're you're kind of getting on there. Uh, what about you, Charlie? I don't know if you've started doing virtual stuff or not. Um, uh, Poncho, I know. You know, you know what? what, what <laughs> no, what I, what I can say, which I'm finding very interesting, when it comes to uh, having conversations with a lot of galleries, <laughs> is I am I'm convinced because of this whole uh, isolation and pandemic that the world's about to change. And I think the art world is a part of that change. Mm -hmm. And I've had conversations with galleries that are saying they're doing better business now than mm -hmm. they've done in years. Yeah. You know, and so like my question becomes, if that's the case and I'm doing better business than I have in year, what is the role of the gallery? Mm -hmm. And so I think the gallery and their role has to be redefined mm -hmm. because I need to understand what their role would be. Otherwise, I don't need them. Right. Galleries, you know, so, galleries right. have been re being redefined since the, the first crash of our business in 2008. Mm -hmm. that, was just before, that was just before the, the, uh, the big economic crash that was pre-internet and pre-social networking. 
Okay. Right. And mm-hmm. so when that happened, we saw 3,000. And Paul knows the list that he gave me had over 3,000 galleries across the country that sold mm. African American art. Ninety mm. percent of those companies crashed and burned. Crash, right. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Out here in Fort Collins, several galleries closed. I mean, it's like the galleries has been struggling for a number of years. And so the Internet did that. Mm-hmm. And so they uh, they're uh, getting on this whole virtual thing is uh, is imperative. Honestly, um, well, getting on the vir- virtual thing is imperative for everybody now. Right. Because uh, like right. I say, uh, uh, the and first it was the website was first, mm-hmm. social networking was second. Now it's inverted. You know, website is down here, social is first, and now it's getting ready to get squished again. Where virtual is going to be on top of that. And then social, and then your network, and whatever else. So it's just it's constantly changing, and technology is at the root of all of it. Right. Yep. Well, Peggy wanted to know how do you get visibility as an artist um, during this time? And Pancho, you have trained a lot of people on uh, just coming out into social media and uh, doing shows on social media, selling on social media. You have several people that have already done that. Well, when I got started, um, me moving into to, to doing a, a, a website caused problems in the industry. Because at that point, galleries and distributors had a big stakehold in artists promoting themselves. So my artists like myself and Charles and even Paul Goodnight with uh, Color Circle, we broke away, did our own distribution companies. But when the internet came and we jumped on the internet, it changed and started a bunch of trends. And so now, yeah, I'm helping people virtually because by us being home there, uh, there's a no, uh, uh, Charlie said, the world is about to change. It changed just before COVID. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. COVID was the change. When they did a streaming, Easter through streaming, mm-hmm. the world changed. And right. so now artists are forced now, the ones that didn't learn social networking now have to catch up and learn websites, social networking, and virtual. Right. Right, mm-hmm. streaming. So and you can stay out of it if you want, but at some point right. you'll be dragged in. Right. Well, that's why I'm so. Uh, I was really pleased um, when Paul and I talked uh, because he, you know I was working with him and uh, him and uh, what was his name? Uh, him and, and Mr. Wider. I was working with him and Mr. Wider would kill me. Uh, I was working with him and Mr. Wider. And, but Paul, you know, he called, he was like, Louise, what do I have to do? And uh, I'm like, well, Paul, (laughs) you know, I have to do your voice now too. I have to do your voice now too. And I said, okay, Paul. And then uh, I told Pancho and I said, and then Paul called me the day before the show, the day, the day before the show with tons of things going on and tons of people calling. And Paul goes, now, what did you say I need to do? Well, you know what? It's funny, but it's at the same time, that's how you get pulled in. You get asked by something like this. And even if you weren't interested in social networking, and even if you weren't interested in streaming, mm-hmm. all of a sudden we're all sitting in this room in four different parts of the country mm-hmm. having this dialogue that our right. clients could never enjoy any other way. Right. right. And that was the beauty of that's that's the reason why I was very glad that you did call back because you are, and I I think I told you that you stay relevant and the best way to stay relevant is to keep up with what's going on. And I'm not even going to tell you Charlie's story when we set up his, uh, you know, you got it. How long were we on the phone, Charlie? It was only three days. We we got it figured out in three days. (laughs) But you know, Charlie, you I just want to give him his props. One of the ways that you really is a good way of marketing yourself is that the world will see your work and you can always use that as a resume. He just did one of the pieces for Time Magazine. Beautiful piece. Good work. Man. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. It's a nice, it's a great marketing tool. And mm-hmm. that, and he never mm-hmm. came out of his own style. Right. Mm-hmm. They accepted his style. It's like right. he didn't have to create something for the other folks. Right. right. 
he created, mm -hmm. he kept his own style. So he stayed true to who he was in terms and fit the bill. And millions of people, whether they know it or not, saw it. Then, uh, then when Charlie, I'm sure he got it on his resume, he said, I did such and such. And they go, oh, yo, yeah, 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 yeah. So that's how it was for me with the TV stuff. Mm -hmm. It really happened by osmosis. Mm -hmm. um, I was in the right place at the right time. And they go, oh, yeah, that's the piece that's on the Fresh Prince. I said, yeah, 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 yeah. But it, the marketing aspect, I never, I had good marketing people mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. But right. I, it, it was Elba Vargas, and she said that I need to know the business but not do the business. Mm -hmm. I was happy that's a good with one. that because I mm -hmm. was really in a place of where I loved doing what I did. I loved traveling mm -hmm. because of it. I love meeting new people, new countries, new customs, new cultures, and see how they relate to me. I love that. And not living there for a while. And then meeting all of these other people. I mean, these guys have created something that won't, you know, the, oh, oh, the best thing I, I, love, I love to say that, you know, this is the year 2020. When I think of 2020, I think of, of uh, a vision, 2020 vision, mm -hmm. right? It's the mark of clarity. When you got 2020 mm. vision, you are clear. Mm. 2020, this is the year, it's the mark of clarity, and you're seeing it mm. happen yeah. right around you. And we are fixing images mm. that is going to be decades older because of this year. I love that. I love, I love that. Yeah. I love what you just said. And mm -hmm. well, you know, we're all like, hurry up and get 20 out of here, 2020 out of here, but they, but you're becoming so see, right. you're the visionary though. That's what I'm saying to you. You are the visionary and these pieces that are being acted on today and this year will be talked about from year to year. So I said, look, I gotta get on the family and I gotta get get off the train station, get on the train. Mm -hmm. And and recognize that I'm a part of this. <coughs> and oh, I'm a citizen. I'm a part of this. I feel mm -hmm. it. Right. So, yeah. So, so clarity is come to it is coming to me. It is twenty twenty. Mm. Mm. Hey, hey, Paul. I was wondering, uh, can I borrow that twenty twenty vision to the, the title of the show? Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 I absolutely, I absolutely love that. I, I love know. that. I, oh I grabbed God. my pen and wrote that down. Like twenty twenty <laughs> vision. Damn it, that's 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 a. We're gonna see that painting, uh, and hey, I want to see Hey, Charlie. Uh huh. I, I'm charging you. <laughs> when you do that, with, uh, when you do that, Charles, I want to make sure that I do an interview with you. We'll okay, interview. we're gonna make it happen. I, that, was, yeah. that was powerful. That was very. Yeah, powerful. I love that. Love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really, really like that. That was. Uh, I'm definitely gonna use that. I have Kenny sitting here in the hole, and they keep peeking at the. I can see you, Kenny, in your crew. Uh, Kenny was actually one of the hosts for the Beauty of Blackness Fine Art Show. His folks just showed up though. Um, Kenny was on uh, California time because Kenny was supposed to come before Poncho came in. <laughs> Poncho mm -hmm. came in. Kenny was on California time. Kenny's a little late. Oh, that's right. So that's, that's he, just, uh, he just showed up. and But Kenny's a musician. And yeah. I told him that he could play you know, a tidbit of uh, his music um on with us because he was uh willing to virtually host uh host the show even though his all of his crew just showed up but they got to watch all of this they got to listen to you guys and interact with you guys which was awesome um so we're gonna let kenny come on and do a little bit of music and you guys are more than welcome to hang out because i always have some time to chat i just i don't want to let you go <laughs> well, let, let me let me say something before I'm gonna, I want to hear Kenny, uh, Kenny perform, but I want to say it's been a pleasure to see you fellows. You guys have been inspirations to me. Uh, I've been motivated and inspired by you in so many different ways. So it's a pleasure to see you guys again. And Puncho, uh, the Morgan State thing years ago, man, I still remember that because it was such a special time. So mm. it's a pleasure seeing you guys. Uh, I really, Louise, what you've made happen it's very special here. And so uh, I'm going to have to tune out after the music, but it was great seeing you guys. Thank, yeah. Thank you, Charlie. You. you know the feeling is mutual, brother. I was going to pop on. You know, I, I just sent Charlie that link uh, 
when I heard Paul was coming on, I sent Charlie that link real quick and Charlie popped right on. <laughs> oh, we, yeah. lo we love you, Paul. Good night. We love you, man. Hey, Charlie. We love you, man. Hey, Charlie, uh -huh. I want to uh -huh. thank you for your sketchbook. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Right. Did you hear that? Uh, <laughs> the world now knows that Larry Pacho Brown owes Paul Goodnight a sketchbook. A sketchbook. Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm not even going to tell you how many years that's been either. <laughs> Too many. Oh, somebody had a question before they before you go. Uh huh. We have a couple of questions. Uh, one: Will the three of you ever do a collaboration, or have you already done one? I could see. I could see that happen. I could see that happen because I, I would love to do something with these two guys. Mm -hmm. That would be powerful. Oh, yeah. I could totally see that. I don't um, even know how that would start. <laughs> I, I think it starts with a theme. Like, Charlie, I sent you that thing on KKK. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, what do you, did you read it? Yeah, I did, man. Uh, it, you know, we'll we'll catch up when we get a chat. Okay. But it's like, right. you know, and I'm there still, was so much and going I'm still on. Waiting we got to talk it. about it. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then we have yeah. one more question, and then I'm going to bring Kenny up. It says, "Mr. Goodnight, what is the story on Mother's gift?" The Mother's Day gifts. I it, it just yeah. says Mother's gift. Is that yeah? Yeah, Mother's Day gifts. Those two young men. I I always think of young men as being gifts, also. So um, they look uh, a little. I, I don't want to say thuggish, but they look, you know, they look that they have that street mm -hmm. feeling about them. But I kind of when you, when you think about it, you know, that's a, their gift. It's up to us to make sure that they're being nurtured mm -hmm. and, they, and the way that they should grow. But we have to start looking at young men differently, not as threats, but as gifts. So that's what that's about. All right, we're going to bring Kenny on. Thank you, guys. This was so awesome. Uh, like I said, look, I'm, I'm humbled in their presence. <laughs> so know that um, I am uh, just very grateful that you guys took the time to join, uh, join in and be a part of the Beauty of Blackness Fine Art Show. Like, I, it's, it's, it's all new. It's all, you know, it's something that I decided to develop and, and would help from poncho and LaShawn and then just bringing you guys in it's just been a blessing to me and i just want you to know that i do not take it for granted that you took time out of your day to stop by okay hey well, thank, thank you poncho, thank, thank you very you. much too man no you're seriously. quite welcome brother anytime uh, poncho is uh, a master <laughs> at, uh, uh, no really at learning communicate mm -hmm. a lot of artists don't communicate well no poncho does yeah he does <laughs> Thank and, you, Paul. You know, and he's got a lot of good work behind it. I'm waiting for that envelope on your new project, Paul. I'm waiting for something. Oh else. my, that was that was Paul's helper. What's his name? <laughs> what what's the helper's name? I mean huh? calling him the helper, but I don't know his name. Oh, Kennedy. All right, see you, Kennedy. All right. All right, I'm now y'all take care. I'm signing off. All right. Kenny's been very patient. So I'm gonna bring Kenny in. Kenny's got a ton of uh Kenny's come into the stream like a billion times. Let's bring Kenny in. All right, Kenny. Hey, everybody. Thank you, you Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh-huh. Kenny's live yeah, from the city of right Angel. Here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, okay. All right, yeah, I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna put you in a full screen. You got your I saw you had your crew with you. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it's, this is uh, this is with me. This is uh, VV right here. She's the queen of the bling. She blings Hi, out a of art, an artist in her own right. Yeah, and this is uh, my boy uh, Abe right here. This guy is uh, uh, you know a PR and promotions guy. Yeah, this is my this is my. This is my yeah, Palestinian uh, uh, brother. Uh, turn your uh, phones and stuff down. Uh, just have one phone on and up. Okay. All right. All right. So is that better? Uh-huh, that's better. Oh, okay. All right, Kenny, what you going to sing for us? Uh, well, what I'm going to do is quickly kind of show a little bit of my own artwork uh, also right quick. You got a minute? Oh. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, so you got to show your artwork instead of singing? Well, yeah, why not? Oh, well, because there was people sitting here waiting to hear you sing, but we'll take artwork, too. Yeah, well, I'll just show a few of my pieces. It's going to be real quick. Okay, let's have it. Well, you got Paul Goodnight in the room and Charlie Palmer and yeah. Larry Puncher. This is definitely the time to show it. That's one of my art pieces right there. That's uh, a Marvin Gaye piece that I've done. Uh, of course, the beautiful Maya Angelou. It's another oh, one that's, of can, you, can you get a little closer? Now, is that writing? Is this painting or graphic? Well, this is a, that's a song titles is what I use. I call, I call this, uh, I call this series a, uh, what's called a speak your truth. So as mm -hmm. a musician and artist myself, when we do, you know, music, we speak our truth. You know, mm -hmm. that's our truth. So uh, that's what this series and homage to, you know, artists are. Of course, this is the immutable Tupac. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Okay. And you're doing, and, and those are all songs that are around them? Yeah, these are all song titles that I use uh, to create a space. And now are you painting these or are you doing these in a graphic program? These, uh, these uh, p are pieces all done with uh, Sharpies and paint pens. Yeah, all Sharpies and, uh, and paint pens. This oh, is another okay. piece uh, of uh, the young new uh, king of the movement, uh, young Colin Kaepernick. Mm -hmm. And what are you doing these in on? Uh, they're all done on uh, canvas. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, all work done on canvas. Mm -hmm. And that's like that was like 30 of his 50 quotes. So with that being said, I will go ahead and do a quick tune. This is from um, from our uh, album called uh, Yeah, this one is from uh, from our album. The name of our group is called God's Elect and the name of the album is called Time. And this is like our single called All It Takes Is One. All right. A unique person lies there deep in you. Rare and exceptional, there's only one you. Don't pass this moment, this chance to linger. And then stop and think. No one else can do this better than you can. All it takes is one to make a difference. Will you be that one? Yes, I know you can. All it takes is one. To make a difference, will you be that one? That was beautiful. I think I heard, wasn't that on the, uh, the album that you sent me? Yes, that is. I you remember that one. On, I remember on, that one. Uh, on uh, iTunes, on Apple Music. You know, on Deezer, Spotify, we're on all of those digital platforms. No, I really like that. I'm gonna bring. I want to, cause um, I just wanted to bring uh, you guys back in. Did you guys see any work? Do you have any uh, any, any golden nuggets for Kenny? Kenny, have you shown your work anywhere? Um. Yeah, I'm. I'm like out in Venice. You know, I'm a. I'm a, a Venice beach artist. I'm out there, you know, on the beach, you know, selling my wares, you know, living the bohemian lifestyle. You know, I love it. You know, music and art is my life. And uh, that's what uh, that's what I do. You can definitely catch me out at the beach. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can catch me online with the music. You know, the group again is God's Elect. The album is called Time. And... Uh, you can catch us on all of the digital platforms. Okay, well, thank you so much, Kenny. That's awesome. I've enjoyed, uh, like I said, you were among some greats, and uh, I thought your work was really nice. 
Yeah, thank you, Louise. And we're, we're appreciating you, you know, presenting a platform like this for artists, you know, to be able to uh, show their art. You know, it's incredible. And uh, hey, thank God for you and that you have uh, continued success. And uh, also to all of the, the gentlemen that were there, you know, uh, Brother uh, Poncho and Brother Charlie, and uh, I forgot the other. Mr. Goodnight. Yes, Mr. Right. Goodnight. Yes. <laughs> all right, thank you. You take care and tell all your folks they say hi. Yeah, that was my other friend that just popped in too, Brother Mike right there. He's a tennis hi. player. Yeah, that's Brother Mike, Guru Tennis. There you go. All right. See you guys later. Thanks for hosting. Okay. That was pretty fantastic and pretty fabulous to have so many people pop in and say hi to us. I just brought Poncho back up for a second. We're going to be bringing Karen, Karen on. I think we might have uh, bumped a little bit into Karen's time, so we're going to bring Karen on. Um, let's see. Karen, are you there? Hi, Karen. Hi, Louise. Okay, sorry we bumped a little bit into your time. We oh, have a good right. night here, and uh, you know that's always a fabulous moment. So we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm just gonna turn it right over to you. I'm not gonna take up any more of your time. Okay. All right, Louise. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Again, uh, I'm Karen. Your artist, Karen Jury, and uh, again, welcome to the Beauty of Blackness Fine Art Show. Uh, I'm hoping that everyone is uh, enjoying what they're seeing. And uh, as I mentioned before, as I mentioned before, uh, I'm an artist who does both 2D and 3D artwork. Uh, the, the 2D, I, I showed some of that last night in terms of some of the uh, paintings that I had done. Most of them were pictures of people. And uh, tonight I wanna talk a little bit about my 3D work. Uh, as I mentioned before, the concept that I use for my work is centers around those uncomfortable issues uh, that deal with uh, social, political, and cultural constructs. Those are primarily racism, sexism, uh, um, classism, and mental illness. And uh, I told you that most of the work I do in 3D is fabrication and installation. Uh, I do some casting, some modeling, and some mold making. Uh, so um, I also had mentioned that the purpose of my work is to share my strength and hope uh, in the form of art, and plus it provides me a voice and a platform to discuss those very uncomfortable issues. Uh, through my work, I'm able to communicate who I am, um, and I'm, I'm compelled to express my work using wood, metal, glass, found objects, paper, and so forth, and I also use those types of uh, materials to evoke emotions and feelings from the viewer. The most important aspect of my work, however, is process and development, because uh, through process and development, it allows me to break barriers of my own uh, thinking. And uh, as I mentioned last night, when I recognized that not only was art a, a, a deep passion of mine, but that um, it, it is a therapeutic means for me and by it being therapeutic, it is when I truly found my own identity. Again, I like to say welcome, and what I would like to do now is talk about some of the art um, that I have been working with. Give me one moment. Just bear with me one moment. Hello. Um, well, right now, I guess my share screen is not working, but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you all some of the uh, artwork that I have created. Um, and the purpose of the artwork was that originally I had decided to work with. Uh, oh, sorry. 
Karen, did you need your screen? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Hold on. Let me get out. Let me get out of your way. <laughs> oh, hold on. Let me get out of the way. All right, here we go. Oh, give me one moment. All right, here we go, here we go. Beautiful, full screen. Let me take it right back. Okay. Full screen, enter full screen. Here we go. Okay. Sorry about that uh, bit of uh, technical difficulty. But uh, this piece right here, uh, what this piece is, it is an installation piece that I decided to do at uh, the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point. Um, I decided to do this piece. Originally, I was going to do a piece dealing with race and racism in America using these faces. I decided to make a mold of my face. And with the mold, uh, originally I was only going to do five faces, and someone came up with the brilliant idea, well, maybe you should do more faces. So, you know, I thought about it, and I pondered, you know, um, if I should, due to COVID, I was able to um, go home and just stay in my house, and I decided to crank out as many of these faces as I could. As I mentioned before, this is uh, a mold of my face. And I decided to use my face uh, because I didn't want to offend anybody, although that really wasn't an issue for me. And so uh, upon creating all of these faces, uh, like I said, I wanted to do a piece uh, depicting race, my own experience with race. And um, I thought about it and then I said, well, I also want to include uh, uh, sexism and classism and mental health, as I mentioned, uh, last night, I had been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of serving in the Gulf War. And uh, I decided to go primarily with my mental health issue. Um, I decided to take one face, paint it black, and sit it outside of all of the other faces because when I'm dealing with uh, PTSD and my symptoms seem to escalate, it is at that point that I will uh, isolate, I tend to isolate, and I isolate from family, friends, and, and sometimes from my own self, you know, but uh, I'm grateful to be here as an artist, and as I said, art allows me to, um, as a, it is a means of therapy for me. So when I was doing this piece, uh, I was, you know, feeling very calm, um, I was able to think clearly, uh, and I was able to process just what I wanted to do. As I said, this piece, it, although it depicts mental health, but it can also be representative of racism, the racism that I've dealt with, uh, whether it has been in the classroom, in the workforce, um, you know, in the military, where I sometimes felt like an outsider. Um, and so, again, here's the piece. And the third thing is that it can also represent sexism. You know, being in a, uh, an environment or a, a, a society where it's primarily been male dominated. Uh, and now we still deal with some of that, you know, and, and being a woman working around a lot of males, oftentimes I would also feel isolated. Hence, here is the piece, the name of it is isolation. Excuse me. This is a, another piece of, and, and, and I could not bring all of these pieces with me. That's why I'm showing you this uh, right now, and later I'll show you some actual pieces that I have. This piece is, is uh, entitled uh, uh, Confined. You know, sometimes I feel like I'm confined, and this piece deals with me being in my own way sometimes, you know, having all of my own self around me, and if I just get out of the way, things could uh, run a little smoother. The third one here, uh, this piece is entitled um, Harmony. 
Um, I decided to do this piece in in memory of uh, veterans who have uh, lost their lives. And I was thinking about all of the graves um, in the cemetery, the Arlington Cemetery, where so many veterans are uh, buried there. I decided to do this piece. Uh, I thought that it uh, had a nice flow to it. I love the design, which has a, a diamond shape and, and it has depth to it. Hence, this piece, this piece is uh, entitled, excuse me. Okay, um, one of the things that I would like to talk about are the pieces in which I took the faces and I decided to do some different arrangements with these faces. This piece right here is entitled Face to Face. I decided to do a one black face and one white face. Uh, the next few pieces that I'll show you, it deals with racism. Uh, the face to face is saying that we should, you know, have conversation about this. It should not be, you know, pushed under the rug. Uh, and with all of the deaths of so many black males due to police brutality and police violence, I decided that if we could just sit down, have a conversation, you know, talk about it, and if, if we could just uh, own up to some of the things that we do, you know, maybe the situation could be better. What I would like to do now is talk about uh, some other pieces. Um, here, this piece right here is entitled Hiding Behind the Mask. I decided to use three pieces here uh, because oftentimes in society, the uh, issues and the atrocities that occur within our society, we tend to want to hide behind it instead of uh, confronting it and, 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 hit and addressing it head on. <coughs> this piece, it is entitled, It's My Season. And I did this piece of uh, for myself, I, you know, been, I've been doing art for about 40 years. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I had uh, graduated from the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point. My degree was originally in graphic design. Uh, I did that last year I graduated. And then upon um, talking to one of the sculpture instructors, I decided to do the sculpture. I had talked to this person and I told them what my dreams and my goals were. And uh, he, this gentleman, uh, Jen Man Joe, he got me interested in sculpture and he started telling me to do art that, some of the art that represents myself with these faces. And uh, hence I decided to do this for It's My Season. I believe that it's my season to um, excel as an artist. I believe that it's my season to have opportunities and I'm so blessed to have been included as one of the artists in this uh, venue, and, and it's been a blessing. Um, this, this piece is, I've entitled it, Two Heads Are Better Than One. And I talk about two heads being better than one because if, if one person is the only one making all the decisions for everybody else, that may not be the right decision for everybody collectively. Sometimes, you know, we have to include uh, various uh, individuals, different um, ethnicities. You know, we have to be diverse in what we do, what we say, how we do it, how we say it, just to include everybody. Um, I entitled this piece, uh, You Can Lean On Me. And this piece, uh, it talks about leaning on, on the, the other person so that uh, if, if they happen to fall short, you know, sometimes we go through things that uh, we, can't, we can't seem to deal with just on our own. And we need the support of whether it's family, friends, you know, uh, uh, um, sometimes uh, fellow employees or, or whoever, but it's talking about you can lean on me and it's talking about and I decided to keep the black and white face because that is the most contrasting colors that we can get. And uh, it, it, it also deals with the race issue. Okay. 
this next piece that I did, um, I decided to put the two heads up and, and upright and to um, view them from a top view. This piece deals with me personally. Again, it deals with my um, PTSD. I decided to name it Rejection, The Battle Within, um, because as a child, I lost my parent, my, my parents at young ages, my mom when I was nine, my father when I was 19. And, uh, you know, even though family steps in, but sometimes family does not treat you like their own. Uh, and I, I just sometimes felt so rejected, you know. Um, and as a result of my PTSD and going into the military, and as I mentioned before, some of the other racial Oh, hi. Did, <laughs> did Karen leave the room? Karen left the room. Hi, where's Poncho? Hey, Poncho, you there? Da -da -da. I think, thank you, gentlemen. Okay, great. So this has been pretty exciting. It's been a really, really exciting day. I've uh, just been able to experience all the amazing artists that have come on board and participated with us has been quite the adventure. Um, and I'm hoping you guys are enjoying it as well, as well as I am. I um, thought I was going to have time to drink a little soda, but my little blackberry, I'm going to put this over here, behind my really cool Beauty of Blackness Fine Art Show glasses, behind my Beauty of Blackness Fine Art Show glasses, um, so I think Karen's coming back up. I think Karen is coming back up. I think she was experiencing a little bit of technical difficulties. So let's bring her back up. It's been technical difficulty today, <laughs> right? So we're going to bring Karen back up with her things. Here we go. 
Hey, Karen. Yes, Louise. Uh, yes, there was some technical difficulties. I came back upstairs and I'm like, oh, what happened to Karen? <laughs> All right, I'll leave it to you. I'm going to stop you back. Okay, so, uh, okay, so, yes, yes, I apologize for that. So, what I want to do now, so, what I want to do now. I want to show you all some of the other artwork, some of the other artwork that I've been doing. All right. So this one I'm going to talk about. It is about entitled code switching. Now, for some of you who don't know what code switching is, code switching is that uh, society uses when you want to uh, change up some an environment, one environment, another environment. As I said, uh, one society to because uh, African American, 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 Black men are stereotyped or stereotyped uh, when in terms of uh, when white Americans see them, and they see black men, they see white people, and so we sometimes have to change up to change up to what what do you have? Do you have something else on? Do you have something else on? I hear something else talking. Okay. All right, Louise, can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Okay. So uh, what I was saying was uh, I'm going to talk about code switching, and I want to uh, show you the picture. All right, so here, I decide, what I decided to do was I decided to take two of the uh, masks that I had and and this name, this uh, code switching is when we decide to uh, change the way we are sometimes depending on the environment we, we're in. For instance, the way I would, the way I would uh, uh, act around my friends may be very different than the way I would act in the workplace. And so it's like turning on one um, Karen jewelry and then turning it off when I get home because I can let my hair down and I can relax. And so what I decided to do was I decided to do two faces here. And on each face, I decided to put uh, binary digits all across the face. Now on this uh, black face, I decided to put all white binary digits. On this white face, I decided to put all black binary digits and I decided to fill this space up completely because there are times when some people just code switch all the time. They want to be someone else. They want to act like someone else rather than themselves. The reason I put every other line on the black face with binary digits is because some people only code switch when it's necessary, when they have to. However, people code switch for various reasons. Some people code switch because they want something from you. Some people code switch because they want to be something that they're not. Others may code switch because they uh, feel the need to, in that environment, to get something accomplished. And, and, and hence, the name code switching. All right. Uh, here I have another piece with both of the faces. However, these faces are left uh, solid in black and white. Uh, I have them mounted facing opposite each other with the chins and it is entitled uh, My Brother's Keeper. I decided to mount it on a, a board which is wood and I decided to contrast each side with opposite colors on the black face 
of course, the white color, and on the white face, the black color. Again, this piece, it is um, a piece that refers to racism. Hello. Hello. There we go. Okay, we should often um, try to work with each other. I, I feel that we are our brother's keeper, and hence the piece entitled My Brother's Keeper. And what I want to do is go back and just go over some of the other pieces um, that I have, and then I will show you one other piece of the glass chair. So I will do a share story. Mm -hmm. Karen, we can't hear you. We can't hear you, Karen. Can you hear me now, Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. So with this piece, uh, this piece was entitled uh, Defined by Words in Terms of Labels. The first chair, it is uh, a chair that has the word smart on it. It's crystal clear. Okay, Louise, for some reason there are some technical difficulties. Okay, give me one moment, Louise. So Karen, you must have another device on. Uh, there has to be another device on. You have to mute it and turn the volume down. Just mute it and turn the volume down. Okay, so I can't hear you talking now.
yeah. Well, yeah. I think so. Yeah, because I changed the thing. I changed the time. Um. Karen, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Your mic is muted. Hello? Okay, we can hear you. Okay, I can hear you now. Okay, okay. so let me. All right, I don't know what's going on with the technical difficulties. It's okay, keep going. You're doing fine. But, um, That's what, what happens in a live do show. Is Okay, Louise, I'm gonna um you have how much more time do I have? You got plenty of time. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, what I would like to do now is I would like to um show you all a glass chair, one of the glass chairs that I did. Okay. Uh, this glass chair, this is one of the glass uh -huh. chairs. Hold on, let me put it up. Can you hear me, Louise? So they can see it. All right, oh, not me. <laughs> I'm always putting myself in for some reason. Okay, the glass chair that I created here, again, like I said, I put it, um, used the kiln to do it. Um, maybe about three or four years ago, I decided to do some, um, glass blowing work and with that I found out that wasn't for me it's too hot <laughs> you know I, I kept burning myself and so I decided well, maybe I'll try something else with the glass last night I showed you all what I did with glass in terms of my 2d and 3d work um and I decided to use some paint wood and so forth this time I decided I'm, I'm gonna do a whole chair you know uh I hadn't known of anyone to do it and what I did was, again, like I stacked glass and so forth. But this time, being a graphic designer, I decided that what I was going to do was to put some text on the glass. Now, if you look closely, uh, you'll see that all of this text, let me turn it all of the text that I used here, I decided to uh, use a silk screen, excuse me, not silk screen. I just, well, I did have the silk screen that I had to create a silk screen of it. And then I had to uh, use another material in which it would make a copy of the letters in reverse. Uh, at that point, I put that material on the chair 
and I decided to sandblast the glass. So I sandblasted it, and what, what it does is that when you sandblast it, it uh, leaves all of the exposed area. And then I decided to use um, the sandblaster to also give the glass a frosty look. As you can see, some of the glass, it has a clear, um, a clear type of look on it. And then you also have the frosty look back here. And uh, the way that I put the chair together was that I actually used UV glue, a UV lamp, and it holds. I've actually had people sit on the chair. Although it is not for sitting, it is purely aesthetic. So, uh, with that being said, uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed using uh, glass with my 2D, 3D work. Again, I like to use plaster, uh, mold making, uh, the fabrication and installation work. I expect to do more of that work. Uh, I'm excited about moving forward with a lot of these pieces with the faces because I think that they speak to a lot of the issues that we are dealing with today. Um, I'm hoping that you enjoyed it. Again, what, what's going to happen um, with some of the artwork that I'm doing, uh, I'm expecting to be able to uh, create more for installation work. As a result of the ones that you saw earlier, Isolation was that piece where there were actually 81 heads in that piece. Um, I ended up doing 125 heads total. I used about 82 of those heads in the piece isolation. With that piece, um, I was very, very happy when I won an international award with the um, International Sculpture Magazine. Um, and that was Although it was an honorable mention, for me it was a great accomplishment because uh, I, I really wasn't expecting it. Uh, for, for most artists that submit their work there, they've been professional artists for many years. And uh, the fact that I'm just an up and coming artist, for me that was a great, great accomplishment. Um, so right now what I'm doing is I'm just trying to do more um, sculpture work. Uh, what I would like to do is incorporate more metal into my work. Um, I've just learned how to uh, weld within the last year. Um, so what I, what I would like to do is to put more metal into my work, uh, add a little more glass, and um, I, I already am putting wood in. I really, really love to work with wood. Uh, one of the things that I am looking at now is I'm, I'm going back to school um, to continue my education. I love education. I love learning. Um, I, as mentioned earlier, I have the degree in uh, graphic design. I have acquired the degree in 3D, and now I'm trying to um, get a degree in 2D, in which I would like to uh, emphasize, put, have an emphasis in graphic narration and uh, illustration. And so uh, for my next day, which is tomorrow, um, which will be the third day of the um, Beauty and Blackness Fine Arts show, I will be going over some of my graphic narration and my illustration work. Uh, with that, I'm trying to use some of that work so that I can create children's books. Uh, I'm also working on a, um, on a, a graphic novel, which is uh, an autobiography of myself. So uh, I, I hope that you've enjoyed what you've seen. I would like to apologize for all of the technical difficulties, but um, stay tuned and enjoy. Uh, we, we have a, a lot more coming up for you. Thank you, Louise. And I apologize, Louise, for the technical difficulty. Louise, is she on mute? Are you on mute? See, technical difficulties are part of the show. <laughs> <laughs>
all a part of the show. Um, it's a learning experience. Yeah, don't worry. It's all a learning experience. Don't worry about it. Um, I had technical difficulties early on. Uh, uh, Ethel just had some serious technical difficulties. Corinthia had some yesterday. So we all experienced some form of weird technical difficulties. That's the beauty of live. You know, we were on, huh? And, and that's why it's called the beauty of blackness. There you go. It's and that's it. And it's just it's a live show. So whatever happens, we expect, you know, I'm not expecting perfection because I already know that things happen. So Karen, how did you prepare for um, prepare for this show? You um, what kind of things that you went through to get prepared for this show? Well, um, I, after you had told me about the show, I was thinking to myself, I didn't, I, well, I was thinking, I don't have enough art. I don't have enough art. And you were like, well, just, you know, go, I'm quite sure you got enough art around. And so I said, yeah, I do. Some of it I could not bring because it was like with the heads. I couldn't transport all of the heads here uh, because I had to, um, I, would, I would need a large area to uh, install them. But what I did was I had some of the heads still left, you know, from the installation. And I decided with the other about 40, with the, with the other 40 heads, well, let me take some of those heads out and get creative with some of the work that I've been thinking about doing. So I decided to do like the, uh, the uh, code switching heads. I decided that, hey, I can go ahead and, and, and work on the other art and so forth. And of course, talking with you, the poncho, and uh, you know, that was very inspiring. And knowing that there were going to be other artists for me, it's really great because uh, I just would never have thought I would be doing an art show with some of the names that you have uh, participating in this. So it made me kind of try to turn the game up a notch or two. You know, but you think you're to turn my game up a notch. <laughs> Yes. So um, you know, but I'm just I'm just grateful, Louise, to be able to show some of my art to put for you to help me to get my name out there. Um, you know, sure, I would love for someone to, to buy my art, but right now I'm just grateful to get it out there. Um, I um, you know I'm feeling good about it, and like the piece that I showed you, which was. Uh, uh, the, the piece with two of the heads. It's my time. I really feel that as an artist, it's my time to to get get myself known, to, to right. put some things out there to explore. And with you doing this virtual show, it is definitely helping me to uh, learn how to do a virtual show. You know, so I'm grateful just to learn some things. You know, to pick up some things that with Pancho Brown sitting. In, you know, he was he's like uh, choreographing. Well, you, you do this and you do that, and, I, and, and I'm loving it. You know. Right. I love it. I love that that he's been so helpful with you. Um, you all have really, really helped me to put it together because I really didn't know what I would be doing, you know. And for you all to, in, in like two or three days, just to get all of the artists up to snuff on the technological piece, you know, it, 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 that's a big thing. That's a that's a big thing. You know, and, and Grant, we've had some little technical difficulties, but the show must go on. Technical difficulties. <laughs> right. But, but it's, been, it's been great. Um, I, I really am expecting to um, maybe do some networking with some of the artists that you have. Mm. Uh, maybe I can learn some things. No, not maybe. I know I can learn some right. things. From them. You know, Karen, um, I wanted to ask you, um, with the coding mask, did you mm -hmm. do that? How did you put those on there? With these? Uh -huh. I painted them hand by hand. Hand painted them. I hand painted them. What so, I did, pardon me? They're so perfect. What I did, well, um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna admit to something. I took some tape and put it across, you know, so I didn't you know, the tape is still pretty perfect. Too far and uh this one I, I did the, the, the this one I did first. Uh -huh. And with this one, I loved it just by going, you know, all up under it and, and everything. And I mean, yeah, but tape, that's pretty, pretty darn perfect with and, the um, and everything. Yeah, I decided to uh, skip every every other 
line uh -huh. that you know we have some of us codes that we don't we only do it when it's necessary right uh -huh. then we show some folks code switch because uh -huh. they don't realize who they are you know so and i decided to uh do the contrasting colors i thought that that would add something to both yeah of them. i really like those oh you have a question from sandra Sandra wants to know how did you how did the installation opportunity come about? I think that's the one with the heads that you just did. Yes. Um, well, one of my instructors when I was in school, um, and again, I want I want to name him because he has been a, a very very positive uh, influence. Jin Man Joe, he's a sculptor, and he uh, started just telling me I was with the five faces in your five faces that were going to represent each race and he was like well what about a hundred faces and i'm like are you crazy you know i didn't think i could do it but with covid i, I just started cranking them out and he started talking about with all of them originally he put them on the wall mm -hmm. and then we just talked about different uh ways to display and design he's always talked to me about design here and it has to be your concept it has to be your design so I started drawing in my book a lot of the different ways I could uh, design those faces. Mm -hmm. And I just picked out some, and uh, it was a lot of work. I had to, my back was hurting when I <laughs> what are they made out? What are those faces made out of? They're, well, it's a, a medium called uh, hydrocal. Hydrocal is a lot harder than plastic. Mm -hmm. The very first face that I made it was made out of dentite, which is wet. And your husband Louise might know exactly what that is because it's what they make dentures out of. Oh, okay. It, it is super, super hard. And my first uh, mold that I made it was just one, and I made it, and I decided to cast it in bronze. So I casted it in bronze, and it turned out it worked very, very nice. And people were telling me that usually the the molds break. Well, mine didn't break. Okay. So, yeah, and so I, I had fired it, put it in the fire, um, and uh, when it didn't break, I decided I was going to keep that mold out there because I'm going to use it sometime down the road for something else. Nice. And what, I, what I did with these was I made a, a mother mold for them. So when I made the mother mold, I made it out of a, 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 a medium called. Uh, I can't think of it, but it's, it's almost like alginate, and where where they make uh, masks like uh, in, in in movie making. And so what I did with that was I made a mother mold out of it, and then I just kept using that same mother mold, started pouring them, and as soon as they would like almost harden, I take them out because it was easier to clean. Mm -hmm. Then I would just sit it down, and then I go make another one, and I would sit it down, and before you know, it, I had like. Within about five days, I had about 60 or 70. Oh, wow. And then I just continued to make them. And, uh, but, I, but I plan on doing a lot more work with these faces because uh, a lot of people uh, and a lot of um, other artists have, have been really, really impressed with it. So that's kind of boosted my motivation, you know, to kind of do some more work. And what I've been doing is doing a lot of research uh, because, like I said, I deal with those uncomfortable issues dealing with racism, sexism, uh, classism, and mental health. Okay. And then for me, um, you know, I also would like to do some pieces, you know, that are in honor of, of uh, the, those who lost their lives due to COVID, you know? Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, with the faces, there was one uh, instance where I thought about, like, trying to put the face of all of those victims who lost their lives due to police brutality. Mm -hmm. But because it's my face, I decided I'd go, you know, a different route. Everybody's face isn't shaped like my face or, you know, my face is not shaped like their face. So Yeah, but you I mean using that, um uh anybody could be the victim. Yes, uh, yeah. Using it as your face, it's showing mm -hmm. that anybody could be the victim. Right, That's exactly. How, I think LaShawn is in the room. So Karen, thank you so much for participating and being here. I, I love your work. I love the, the faces. I love the, the chairs and all those kind of things. So I am very happy that you decided to join us and be a part of the Media Blackness Fine Arts Show. 
So um, I'm going to bring LaShawn up. And what time are you on tomorrow, Karen? Uh, tomorrow I'm on at 9.30, but, but uh, I think there, there may have been a change uh, in the time, amount of time. Oh, I'll have a look at it. I'll have a look. Everybody should have. Uh, right now, I'm down for one hour, 15 oh, minutes. Oh, no, I changed it. I changed that. Okay. okay. You told me, well, I was like, oh, what? You all tune in tomorrow for Karen's worry. Uh, it's in the morning, but I hope that you can join me because I have some very, very exciting things. Thanks, Louise. Great. All right, Karen. I'll see you later. All right. Have a good one. Good. All right. We will be bringing up. Thank you guys for hanging out and um some of you guys have been with us all day that is overly exciting um thank you so much for hanging out with us and sharing asking questions and being a part and get, being interactive definitely go and check out the website check out the artists check out their artwork karen has some amazing stuff in her room uh excuse me go and check out her room go check out her gallery and uh see the things that that are in there um let her know give her a shout out tomorrow let her know that you like her work also, um, visit the store. There's some really cool stuff in the store. Um, so go and visit the store and check out all of the stuff that all the artists have in their store. So we're going to be bringing LaShawn Bill on. And uh, he's, he's an amazing artist. He actually was one of the artists that helped me um, with uh, connecting with Pon uh, our featured artist, Larry Poncho Brown. And just has been an encouragement uh, throughout this whole entire thing. So we're going to bring LaShawn Bill on for you guys, and he's going to share with you all, okay? Let's bring him in. Hey, LaShawn. There's Karen. Karen. <laughs> hey, LaShawn, can you hear me? Hey, hey. Hey. How's everyone doing? Great. All right, LaShawn, I'm going to turn Karen's still in the house. Karen's still in the house and she left. No, I think Karen, she's still in, she's down there, but not up. So, yeah. So, okay. LaShawn, you all set for the day? Oh, I'm set. I'm ready. All right. Okay. I'm going to turn it over to LaShawn. And you guys are going, you're in for a treat because he has some absolutely amazing work. Louise, Connor, thank you for that introduction and thank you for putting on the beauty blackness art show uh girlfriend you did it you did it this is you did a great job and i'm happy and proud to be a part of it <clears throat> well good evening everyone i'm lashawn bill and i'm gonna start off and give you a little background about myself and we're going to go way back. We're going to go back to my childhood. I was raised in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, and that is, uh, to me, a birthright. I enjoy the city. It has a certain kind of energy. It's a city of hustlers. You know, a lot of people, uh, at least when I was growing up, exposed to a lot of people that were really on their game, a game and getting their hustle on. So I learned from that and adapted those, those traits. We'll discuss how that played out for me <clears throat> a little later. But uh, I got interested in art when I was uh, in the third grade. And uh, my third grade art teacher saw that I had uh, some potential. So she set me aside into my own room and set me up to work on still lifes. And even back then, I was working in oil paints, acrylic, acrylic and oil paints. So uh, I, I had that kind of special attention throughout my school years. Uh, by the time I got to junior high school, I, I did got my first commission piece. And from there, it was on. I had the bug. <clears throat> I wanted to be able to 
figure out a way to sell my art and and you know make a living from it. And I was still in junior high school. But I was fascinated by seeing the artwork in you know furniture stores and and different places and wondering how do you get into those particular venues. So I started trying to figure out how to do that. So as I uh, went into high school, uh, I was doing commission pieces of uh, for my various teachers as well as the parents, uh, my fellow students. And I was also going into my community and uh, finding different places to showcase my work. Uh, I mean, just off the wall places, unconventional places. Uh, I would find, I had one laundromat, just happened to have a big display window. And I asked the owner, could I display some work in there? And he said, sure. So that was getting exposure. And I was like, I'm going to get it however I can get it or however it can be got. I'm going to get it. And uh, I would do that. Um, I would do that in all sorts of venues. The uh, record stores. Uh, the music, we had uh, community centers, Jewish community centers. I approached them. But anywhere, any place, any place I could, I would try to get my work in and get it exposed. In high school, I had an art teacher who I am still friends with to this very day. And we we're, we talk often, and uh, he was probably the most impactful uh, person for me. Not that I didn't learn from the other people, but he was the most impactful because he gave me some true direction and some great opportunities. So uh, he. Yeah, made my first job as an illustrator. I worked for a printing company while I was in high school. And uh, that was a great experience, learning to do copy and all sorts of stuff. So um, after I graduated from high school, I went into the military. And uh, while I was in the military, I did artwork continue to do my artwork. And I continue to try to find places to sell my artwork whenever I could. The military allowed me to travel to places like Africa, uh, you know, South America, where I was exposed to these cultures. And, and it gave me a broader sense of <clears throat> our people and how color plays uh, in the psyche of our people. So when I got back to the States uh, from that partic those particular trips, I had uh, four years left and I got transferred to Baltimore. And while I was in Baltimore, I was able to really get my foot in on uh, doing more stuff in the community because the job that I had was in, was independent duty. So I wasn't being monitored that much. So it gave me the opportunity to venture around DC as well as Maryland and get exposed to everything that you know, cities had to offer. While I was there, I, uh, started doing business with a gallery that had opened up while um, I was stationed there and they were carrying my artwork. And they continued to carry my work after I got out of the military, which was you know three years, three years later. And, uh, and when I got out, I moved to Houston. And while in Houston, uh, my first, couple years you know I had a nine to five job and uh, but I was slowly easing my way into trying to do my art full time I would say within the first after the two or three years I was able to do that in part because of uh, the connections I had made while I was in in Maryland 
one the gal the gallery that uh, had opened up was Gallery 1990, and uh, a, a publishing team had come through there and saw my work, and they were interested in publishing me. So they reached out. We talked and uh, struck up a deal, and they published my first serograph. And it sold out within six months. And that was what put me on a national scene. Um, and, and so from there, I was doing my work full time and just continuing to develop the styles that I, that I use and um, building up my clientele. Now, <clears throat> back in, in the... Uh, early 90s, I was really a gallery artist. I didn't do very many shows. Uh, and uh, so I wasn't exposed to the clientele, the clients as much, because my clients were the, were the gallery owners. As the 90s came to an end, and <clears throat> the art market took a, a major, major hit. I found myself, as well as a lot of artists, that we had to start marketing ourselves because the galleries were closing. So that was a, a time of a, a great learning curve. Uh, and I would say through my whole career, there's always been little things that happen, spaces in time, where you have to have growth spurts and <clears throat> that challenge you to grow and go to grow to the next level. And I, I think about that when I think about what's going on today and how things are going on. And we're in the age of now where we have to do virtual shows and, uh, and being successful at that and making and making that work uh, is is major. So always there's some kind of challenge. Always there's some kind of challenge. And it's just a matter of you know being able to meet that challenge and uh, maneuver through it. So uh, more recently, I've been working on just a lot of different <clears throat> projects. Um, I'm an artist that like to paint on a lot of different objects. I like to work in a lot of different materials. So now I mainly work in acrylic paint and uh, you know mainly paint on canvas, but I also uh, paint on wood, glass, ceramics, uh, leather. And I have everything from my canvas work to functional art, from tables to lamps, chairs, and to fashion, in which I have t-shirts, purses, things of that nature. So constantly evolving as far as that goes and being able to brand myself in a way that, you know, you can I can appeal to a wide range of people. And I think that's really important. Uh, at least it's important for me. And it's something that some artists may want to consider when they're starting to put stuff together, putting their portfolio together as far as their arsenal of things they want to offer offer the, the public. Uh, it's, it's crucial that you also be able to Define your style, you know, what it is that, uh, or better yet, how you want to project your voice, your thoughts, your artistry to the public. And uh, that's probably the biggest channel, the challenge. It's called, it's called having your own thumbprint, getting your thumbprint. But uh, that is developing a style that uh, is distinctive to you, you know, as an artist, where people can look at your artwork and say, okay, that's this artist or that artist works. 
So uh, for me, I think I got to that point probably in the uh, year and a half after moving to Houston. Uh, I was always able to paint a lot of different styles or draw as well in a lot of different styles, but I didn't have something that was distinctively mine. And uh, after some soul searching and just evolving as an artist, the things that I was looking for to really, I, that defined me as far as my style uh, came into play and evolved, I should say, um, when I started thinking about my travels, places I've been to, and the kind of things that were that were appealing to me, and uh, using elements of things I had seen in in my travels to use that in my artwork and developing the style that people most recognize me for and a particular character called the Universal Woman. So that particular character, her features come from the study of wood carvings from West Africa. So in creating this character, I want to have appeal as the name states universal. I want to have appeal to any race. So in doing so, I took it back to the cradle of mankind, which is Africa. In most cultures, there's something in their designs, in their sculptures, or some of their drawings, or art paintings, that are reminiscent to the things that you see in Africa. And I guess most people understand that that's where mankind, mankind began. So that's where I got the features for my character. I gave her uh, a golden can, golden color skin, um, tannish looking, because whether you're Asian, Mexican, Black, or white, subconsciously you can see yourself in this particular character because even as a Caucasian, you subconsciously are, are drawn to that and have an appeal to having that tan colored skin. The color palette, the palette that I decided to use for it, I went with basic colors and uh, but yet very vibrant because when I was traveling through South America and Africa, I noticed that in the architecture, there was a lot of bright colors all over the place, unlike what I saw in the United States or even in other European places I've been. And uh, so I understood that for our people, we're drawn to, to color. So I implemented that in my artwork. The other thing that I implemented into it was tech. So that's the premise of that particular character. And I'm going to share some of uh, those images to give you an idea. I should have had that pulled out. This is what I'm referring to right here. This, 
her features, this is a universal woman, and her features, those come from the study of wood carvings from Africa. You see, the sculptor can't scan the bronze tone. The background colors, the stained glass, represent spirituality. So, you know, I do that in the pieces. Uh, then in the paintings, this is a reproduction right here, but in the paintings, they usually have, they're really heavy textured. So that's the premise behind that. Now, I'm gonna talk about some of my techniques as far as painting goes. And what I have here, I told you I worked in various, various mediums. This is a plate that I'm working on. See if I can switch the camera here. Okay. I'll... Okay, I don't see where it's going to let me is turn it around. But so this plate here. Oh, LaShawn, you're trying to turn your camera. You have your phone camera or is it just, phone. are you using your phone? phone? Yeah, uh, go to cam mic. And uh, when you click on cam mic, it'll have a front yeah. and a back. Yeah, I knew I saw it, saw it earlier. Yeah, it's camera. Right. So it's right next to the mic. Uh, mute stop cam and then it's like the little gear and then if you go to that you should be able to click on that and it should have um, uh, back and front you click on the camera and it should have back and front on it okay there we go there. all right thank you Louise. this is the piece that You're i'm working welcome. on um, they started the background is done. See, it's heavy textured. We have the figure sketched out. I know this is on a paint on a black uh, plate. I always start off a painting in black. The reason being is that actually it's several reasons, but one of the main reasons is that when you start applying color on top of a black surface, it makes it gives the colors the color's depth, that's the main reason. The second reason is when you paint on a black surface, you don't have to use as much paint. So it's twofold. You save money on your paint and it gives you the effect that you're really looking for. Now, you know, you could paint on a any other color uh, other than a white color, um, because if you paint on a white surface, you tend to have to use more paint just to make the color stand out. And sometimes, and a lot of times, is that artists don't put enough paint down. And if you put the color, the painting, the canvas up to the light, you can see all the areas that was missed. So this is just one, and I was working on several things at once. Never do I really work on just one piece. So this is another design. Again, this is just to get an idea of the process. I'm really going with musical themes on these pieces. And I have a total of four of them. They don't look like much now uh, because you have to be able to see the vision. This one is a young lady holding an apple. Nude piece. So 
All right. Well, listen, we're going to go on a little trip in Mr. Beal's home because I have a home studio. We're going to look at some more artwork. Folks, if you got any questions, please feel free to ask them. I'd love to hear from you. We're taking a trip. We're taking a trip. We're taking a trip. This piece right here, I have a jewel. So what's special about this piece, and I don't know how well it shows up in the camera, this is a acrylic painting on paper that is sandwiched between two plates of glass framed. And the head is actually uh, copper foil with acrylic paint on it. I love experimenting. I love doing a lot of mixed media and just having fun with painting. I don't, for me, it's not really work because really, honestly, I just have fun with it. I don't do a lot of commission work. Um, I mainly paint what I want to paint. It's another original on board. So even though I grow, grew up in the city, I would go to the country most summers to see my family in Oklahoma. So this is reminiscent of being down in the country where they would be out there with that big cast iron bucket with steaming hot water, with the lye, put the clothes in there and wash it, churn them, and then hang them out to dry. Here's another mixed media piece. This is out of fabricated board. And this is part of a mask series. Here we have one of my abstracts. I do quite a few abstracts and have been for years. This particular one has a collage in it. And actually that is the page from the Bible. Here's Another mixed media piece, this is sculpted. Polymer board with acrylic paint. Again, out of the mass series. I started doing this particular series about uh, five years ago, about five or six years ago. I love working in this particular material. I love being able to sculpt stuff out and have fun doing that. Here's another piece that is sandwiched between two plates of glass. Uh, that jewel series. It's a smaller piece. Over here, here, we have palm tree thongs. With acrylic paint on them.
unique pieces. Nice conversational piece for your home. Another abstract piece. I think abstracts are so cool because they allow you to express yourself in a different way. They remind me of jazz music. You just have so much uh, inspiration and expression that can go into a piece and it's all spontaneous. Even though there's some thought in putting a piece together. The key is actually making it look spontaneous. These are all done on a variety of materials, uh, wood, boards, canvas. Here we have a mirror, framed mirror. Here we have another sculpted piece. Let me zoom in on that for you so you can see detail. This is a series called Body Beautiful. And they all were just a lot of different funky nude pieces, figurative pieces. So those are just some of the projects that I, that I work on. I believe in marketing, mass marketing, and you doing different things. So we also have stuff like clocks. And switch this camera over. Again, I say I paint on pretty much everything. This is actually a reproduction. But I do clocks, cups, light switch covers. Anything that uh, I think that would sell is what I do. And that's the tour for this evening, folks. So again, please, if you have any questions, we'd we'll love to hear from you. Let me know what you think. Um, if there's something that you would like to know, if you're an inspiring artist, if there's some kind of like things you want to know about the various mediums, uh, let me know. Again, I said I mainly work in acrylics and I keep a ton of them around uh, to, to do what I do with a vast array of brushes uh, and everything else that goes along with creating the artwork. I don't know how I'm doing with my time. Okay, I gotta go, another 15 minutes. So let's talk about insp inspiration. What inspires me, inspires me as an artist? Well, what inspires me is just everyday things, coming in contact with various people, uh, various situations. I could be out eating lunch or something and just see something that said, 
it captures my eye and say, wow, you know what? I can see that in a painting. Uh, conversations on the phone. Some of them may say something and they have a little catchphrase or something that sparks some creative thought. And 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 I just run with it. It may not come to fruition until years later, you know. But it started someplace. Um, I love spending time with other artists and uh, feeding on their creativity and inspiration as well. Uh, I think that's that's important. Um, it allows us to uh, iron sharpens iron. So being around artists that are of a, a certain caliber really helps to, you know, keep you focused. You have a, cu a couple of questions. Um, someone wants to know, do you prime your bases or clocks before you add uh, acrylic paint to them? Uh, you are prime my from idols before I paint them. Yes, you have to prime them because if you don't, the paint won't stick. So you know, some of the scratch right off. So it's important that it be primed, and then you also have to have a a really good sealer sealer to go on it, so that uh, the surface becomes hard. So you no know, one can just you know grab it by the hand and dig dig and nail it. Over. Um, let's see. That one. What's this one? Oh, did they write the same thing? Oh, it's the same print. Wait. Do you prime your bases and clocks? Do you prime your clocks before adding? Oh, Kevin asked the same thing. So I guess <laughs> I guess you can it for both of them. So uh, with this van, wanted to know, are you on IG? What's IG? Instagram? Yes, I am. Uh, you can find me on Facebook under my name, LaShawn Bill, or you can find me on the LaShawn Bill Fine Art on Facebook. Both those two accounts, Bill Fine Art, is uh, my business business page. Also, I'm on Instagram under my name, LaShawn Bill. Nice. Um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Well, guys, if you have more questions, LaShawn's here to answer some questions for you. Um, or he can just share what um, what he's eating. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I could be, you have know, jelly beans. You eat jelly, jelly beans? Yes. <laughs> yeah. You're a jelly yeah. bean. Uh. We're made jelly beans. So, yeah, so getting back to about the priming and stuff, it's good to have uh, the primer, the kind of primer that I use is a, uh, uh, I mainly use an automotive primer because I know that's going to give me a really, really, something that's going to bind really well. And it's a spray, a spray on primer. primer. To, to use. And my primer is black as well. Uh, I usually work with black, black or a gray primer, dark gray primer. And the varnishes that I use are um, oil based. So, you know, if you're sensitive to the fumes and stuff, it's not really you want to be in open space to deal with that. But yeah, any good full base uh, gloss varnish will do the trick. And ideally, you want to use something that's not going to yellow or town brown over time. So the best to use is by Liquitex.
This is one of those gems, folks. This stuff right here. And I don't know. A little more light. Can y'all see that? This is what I use um, when I'm working on an original piece, a canvas piece. And I wanted to have like a super, super high gloss. This is the stuff to use. You brush this on and instantly you're gonna see a big difference in that canvas. And you can add thin layers of this, several layers. And the more layers you add, the more it's gonna become like glass. On the furniture pieces that I do, this is what I use. Bye. Kevin wanted to know how long it takes to dry. This is a clear, clear, clear ground what I use. LaShawn? Um, the, oh, that's the question. Huh? The, um, the, the mid wax one takes a few hours. And it really depends on the uh, your environment. If you're in high community places, it's going to take longer. If you're someplace that you have a lot, of, mm -hmm. it's hot like it is in Houston. It's one of the reasons I like being here. I could put this outside on a sunny day and within a couple hours, it'll be cured, it'll be dry. The, uh, the other varnish in the white bottle, it takes uh, a few hours to dry as well uh, because they're oil based. So uh, as a matter of fact, you can use this uh, liquid text, you can use that on your oil paints. So it's good for that acrylic and oil. But it's designed if you really want um, a really, really gloss, high gloss finish is what it's really, really for. Now you can thin it down with uh, a solvent and, uh, and dilute, you can dilute it so that it's giving you a softer, softer sheen and extending the varnish itself. I don't recommend that. There's much easiest way you can get a spray on and achieve that with no problem. But if you ever want to get that high glass, glass kind of like finish on something, this is your best bet. You have another question about uh, silver markers on abstract drawings. Is it uh, okay to use silver markers on abstract drawings? Yes, it's okay to use anything pretty much. It's just the way of, you know, how you're going to um, preserve it. So what you want to do if using um, silver markets, silver markers, and I'm assuming you're using oil based ones, uh, you want to make sure you put a good finish varnish on top of it. And, uh, you may have to test it. Uh, I will take the marker and I'll mark it on a cardboard or something, then spray the varnish on there and see how it reacts because sometimes the varnish will make that marker bleed some if you have, depending on that, um, depending on the kind of marker that it is. I don't know what brand you're using, but if you're using a good quality brand, you won't have a problem. The issues you have with using the silver markers is that if the painting that track is exposed to a lot of direct sunlight. Those markers can fade after over time. So where you had that silver outline would just become a, a black line or wherever some other color line. So, you know, bear that, bear that in mind. They're, they're fun to work with, they're cool, but um, you're gonna have to really use a good varnish. And I'm gonna show you a brand.
This is what you want. Krylon. That's the brand name. And this stuff will give you a nice machine. And so the key to work, working with varnishes is that you want to spray thin coat. Let them dry. They come back and spray another thin coat. Let that dry. When I say dry, give it, you know, at least like 15 minutes or so. Or, you know, a good hour. Let it dry. And then apply a second coat. Um, you can apply, the more coats you apply to it, the better seal you're going to have on that artwork. So, you know, when you're working with those silver markers, you may want to go in and put something like four coats or varnish on it. And please make sure they dry between the coats because you don't want it to like get milky on you. Uh, with this particular spray, that wouldn't necessarily shouldn't be an issue, but uh, you definitely want to let your coats, you know, air out and dry a little bit before you put another coat on it. And the more coats you have, will still that marker in that way, you know, it'll make it more fake. All right, thank you, LaShawn. We seem to have, we have I, Our Story Studio and Corinthian people both in the queue right now. This has been wonderful. LaShawn, I always enjoy your work because your work is absolutely beautiful. Um, so I always enjoy it. And I always learn something new from your conversations and the things that you share. Um, they're saying great feedback and thank you. Everybody's thanking you uh, for your, what you've shared. It's, and to be able to walk through your studio uh, <laughs> is always a delight. So thanks a lot. And what time are you on tomorrow? Do you know? No. Yes, I am. <laughs> um, yes, no, I do know actually from four okay. to four forty-five. Okay, yeah. you're on at four. So stop by tomorrow and see what else Sean has. The Sean has for you. Yeah, also, uh, we have a cute. We have a question and answer at 12 at noon. All right, LaShawn will be in a question and answer at 12 tomorrow with um, Aaron and Gina Paskins and uh, Thomas Lockhart. It's something you don't want to miss. It'll be hosted by Beverly um, Beverly Hunt. Hopefully Beverly can make it. She's got some things going on, but hopefully Beverly Hunt will be able to make it. She'll be asking you guys questions. So uh, we're looking forward to that. Thanks a lot, LaShawn. All right, guys, take care. Appreciate you. All right, up next we have um, the Paskins. We have Aaron and Gina Paskins coming up next, and then after that we will have Miss the jewelry designer, Miss Corinthia Peoples. So you guys stick around. This is something worth looking forward to. What does it say? Okay, um, so we're gonna bring in Aaron and Gina Paskins. We're really excited about having them. They're a fun couple, uh, lots of energy, very excited about the work that they have. So we're going to bring them up. Uh, where are they? Sorry, you oh, I still got oh, LaShawn. Yeah, hey, Aaron and Gina Paskin. How are you guys? Well, hello. Welcome, welcome. You guys have waited all day to come by and say hi, huh? Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, that lights up. I did not know that. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. I did not know that that lit up. How is it backlit? It's well, you're going to talk about it, so I'll listen. I'll listen to you talk about it. All right, guys, I'm going to turn it over to you because I know we've eaten into a little bit of your time and I don't want to eat into any more of it. That's so it. you guys take the wheel. Well, good evening and welcome back to the Beauty of Blackness Fine Art Show. We are your evening um, presentation. This is Erin Paskins. Myself is Gina. And we are from Our Story Studios. We're located out of Delaware. Um, you can visit us at OurStoryStudiosArt.com um, for anything, any questions that you may have. Please feel free to stop by our store with um, the Beauty of Fine Art. Um, Black, uh, Beauty of Blackness Fine Art, where you can visit us and see the pieces that we have 
inside the store. I think you will engage and you will love them. Uh, we have never done a virtual show, but we are loving what we're doing today. We are excited. We are glad to be a part of this uh, this avenue or this new norm, as we call it. So we got to sit back. I want you guys to share with us. I want you to like with us. Give some thumbs up. Tell your Facebook family, your friends, Instagram. We own all of it. Link Media, Twitter, all of them. Let them know that we are live and we are here for you. We are there to answer whatever your questions may be. And you can also request a Zoom meeting link where you can meet us personally behind right. closed doors. We are here and we going to continue to be here throughout the rest of the <coughs> remaining time that the show is activated. And so you can always reach out at any time. So right now I'm going to turn it over to the master, my, my best friend, my compadre, my partner in crime. We do things together because we've been together a long time. So everything that he does, I do. So we, we're doing it straight up, straightforward. We're not going to leave anything out. If you have questions, please feel free to just chime in and let us know. And we will do the very best that we can to answer them. Um, I give to you, I present to some, introduce to others, None other than my best friend, my partner, Aaron Pask, is the sculptor. Hello, everyone, all my fellow artists. Beauty of Blackness Show, this is where it's at. Support us. We have taken the time. We paid our dues to get here. Most of us have been in this business for many, many years. You're seeing masters of the craft here. So let's talk about what we do at Our Story Studio. What we do is we create masterpieces. We're all about creating masterpieces. Some artists say we create artwork. Some artists say we create commercial art. Some artists say that we just do art in general. I tend to push it a little bit. We tend to push it a little bit more than that. We always want to think and have our customers, clients, patrons thinking that these are masterpieces. That's what we're in the business of. I don't do additions. We don't do additions. We don't do any one-offs. We do straight, one-of-a-kind pieces of work, all customized. We have clientele from all gamuts, from the highest to the high to the one percenters, all the way to payment plans of somebody who's on an affordable budget. There is no problem with that in general. Now, part of what we do is one of the things is coming up with a concept. And I always like to go from what we do, what we create, and to how do we do that. Everything that's magical, everything that has of importance always starts out with some kind of thought process, starts off with some kind of theme. Uh, before we get into that and while we're getting into that, we need to talk about the background of how we all came about this. My wife, Gina, who's the reins of the operation, who wants the financial part, if you ever decide to order something, if you ever want something custom made, she's the one that you will be talking to. You will never hardly ever get to talk to me because I'm always working on creations and I try to devote 100% of my time to creating these masterpieces. That's what it takes. Now, with, her, with Gina, Gina has a BA degree from Bethune Cookman. She's very smart in business. She knows how to wheel and deal. We deal with galleries, we deal with private clients, we deal with corporations, and we deal with all kinds of entities because we're always working from monuments to special commissions. Where I come in my part, I deal with mainly of the figurative art, the concept, the creation to get the product to the client, to make sure that, it, that the client is happy with it, that the client is, is astounded if they're amazed with it. That's what my job is. My job is to create the masterpieces. I have various degrees in art, art business, art education, and in sculpting. Uh, I've done the whole gamut of all that from teaching to, to, to just working in the craft and working for museums. So I bring a wealth of knowledge into what we do. Now, one of the questions, like I said, is how do we do what, what, what we're trying to do? We create artwork based on concepts. Uh, we always go with a concept. Sometimes Gina will say something or I'll feed some information to her and we come up with a concept that makes sense. I'm real particular as far as the work that we do, as far as just not throwing things out there too abstract. Like for instance, I wanna have some kind of unity. I wouldn't just wanna do paintings of uh, pets. 
paintings of seascapes and then paintings of cityscapes and then paintings of baseball players and all that. You're all over the place. I don't really work like that. It has to have a concept. Either the client will provide a concept or we'll come up with a concept. Most of the stuff that we do that we show, like you're going to see in the show, has all been pre-themed. They're all kind of fitting in what we call an indigenous, kind of an Africanized style. So, but we do have plenty of other work that's out there that are that are totally different than these. But these are more indigenous cultures, different parts of Africa. We'll take a little bit of this, we'll take a little bit of that, and we come up with something unique. That's what we do, and that's what we try to say. With the pieces that you're going to see, you're going to get something that's called a provenance. Now, a provenance basically is almost like a title. Some artists use what they call authenticity sheets, uh, certificates of authenticity. I use what's used in the museum world, the fine art world, because that's what primarily we sell, fine art, as a provenance. It means it's going to have a background. It's going to tell you if it's coming directly from us, it's going to say it's going to mean direct from us. If it's been in museums, it's going to tell you what museums that it's been in. If it's been in shows or it's traveled a circuit of shows, you're going to have a listing of every single show that it has been in. You're going to get examples of what catalogs it's been in. You're going to get photos of where it has been and what it has. You're going to also get some samples of promotion material if it has been put on posters, postcards, and all like that with your piece because the pieces are investments. Again, we create treasures. Some of the materials that we use, let's go into that. Now, materials are from every artist. Every artist is kind of individual. It's almost like a gigantic salad bar. Some people like this, some people like that, some people use a combination. I use and we use a combination of things. We use natural elements from bamboo to all kinds of exotic woods, to leaves, to all kinds of various things. We also use precious stones, from jade to turquoise, from diamonds to some of the rubies, some of those things we've been fortunate enough to pick some of the various things and incorporate all kinds of beautiful things like that. We also use various oxides, iron oxide. One of my favorite, 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 favorite patinas is using iron oxide. Some people probably out there are saying, what is he talking about iron oxide? Rust. A lot of the browns that you see in the work are, are not actually colored. They're actually oxides created from rust, rusty nails. Placing nails in a pot, letting the rainwater, the acid water, build up until it creates what they call iron oxide. That is then applied to the patina or to the piece with heat. After it's dried and reheated and reheated, you get these beautiful oranges, these beautiful browns. Some of the things we use, I use mica crystals. I use all kinds of, of metal flakes and all things like that along with using traditional colors. So those are some of the ways that we do. Let me go into a little bit of the techniques that we use. Some of the techniques that we use, we, we cast some items, we carve a lot of items, and sometimes we use a combination of items. Sometimes we'll weld something, whether that's TIG welding, whether that's MIG welding, or whether that's ARC welding. It depends on the size and the scope of the project. Uh, a lot of our larger stuff, has to have steel frames in it because they're so large and for safety reason they have to have steel under them uh in a couple of days if you hang around with the show and we pray and hope that you do to support either ourselves or other artists we'll bring out larger pieces like mufasa so you can get to see how grand that he is and maybe tomorrow we might even do bella a full scale full figure so that you can see how beautiful that she is and what it takes some of the time limits that we create using these, they can go up from four months to a year. Uh, some of the pieces are very intricate. You're going to see various hairstyles. You're going to see intricate braiding. You're going to see all kinds of adornment. Adornment mean, basically meaning all kinds of jewelry that's handcrafted for these pieces. We try to take our time with them. That's what takes so long in creating the pieces. Uh, Again, I believe in combination. I think that it's just like a great painting. When you use various colors, you bring life to the painting. So when we use various materials, we try to bring life to the creation of what we're doing. Uh, some of the things that go into this, again, is how we do it again, is one of the things when you think about concept, you, you, there's so many different concepts. So if we were going to portray something of love or we're going to portray something in unity or we're going to try to give you something combining how a person feels for another person, 
there's there's a gamut of that, which is just not something that we rush into. We try to take our time. I try to think of it, okay, well, how would I feel? I try to get the perspective of how another person feels. I try to get a perspective, okay, what's a person's interpretation or general scope of a theme? And once we nail that down, once we're all secure with that, we usually go into that theme and develop it through a series of drawings, uh, through a, a lot of research. A lot of research goes behind uh, some of the things that we're working on because, again, we're working on monuments. We're working on a piece right now that's called the Auction Block, which is uh, going to be a really magnificent piece when it's finished. Um, we have several collectors already looking at that, but we're holding everything in bay. That will probably be debuted most likely in Los Angeles, um, just due to the scope of the scale of it, what it's going to be. Uh, tomorrow, during a preview, I will show a small model of that, a maquette, what's called, uh, of the auction block, so you can get a feel of, or an imaginary view of what the larger one will look like. So that's something to look forward to, too, also. Again, one thing that I would like to say, too, is going back to the Beauty of Blackness art show. It's a fantastic virtual show. You get to talk to the artists firsthand all day long. Think about that. There is no other venue where you're going to have to compete and just listen to artists. and You get to get the in-depth scoop on what we do, how we do, and why what we're doing. So you should pay attention. You should support us. You can't complain 30 or 40 years from now that, man, I wish I would have had that or everybody has that because this is your opportunity to do so. So that, that, is, that, that is some of the things that we do. I want to get into some of these pieces now. The piece that you see behind my big head here is, is a piece called Spiritual Alliance. And a spirit, spiritual alignment, excuse me, I said alliance, but it means spiritual <laughs> Alignment and basically what this is is an indigenous culture of children and a spiritual kind of pose. And I wanted to create the effect that I'll stand away yes. from it so you can see it. I wanted to create the effect that if you were going to a ceremony, that you would be partaking in the ceremony. And one of the ways to create that was to have you feel like you're coming over the shoulders of one of the children sitting down. So I wanted to create the vision, the feel that you were participating in this alignment ceremony. I wanted you to give. Now, a lot of people say, wow, how in the world are you getting it to glow? That all deals with a technique called tarsaria. It works on light marks, it's not a lighting effect. It's not done with lights or LEDs. It's done with pure color and studying how color reflects and reflective light. I chose that to represent, I, I put a petal in the middle of it because I wanted it to resemble like a flame, like something that is sacred, that something that would bond us, something that would, we would remember forever. In this particular piece, we created one version that was like this, and this, and there was another version that was created, which was the first version that was created with a totally different flower that was very orange. As soon as the, the collector saw it, they had to have this. And I had intended it for the world to see, so I had to create another one that was totally different. So this is what you see here. You see the pink version in this. So a little bit about this piece, it has a lot of bronze in it. It has iron oxide. That's where you're getting some of the browns. It uses all kinds of various colors, um, from pinks, yellows, and, and all kinds of underpaintings like that. It takes weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks to do that. It's a combination of casting, carving, letting it sit, heating it, reheating it, and reheating it. This took this particular piece took about three months because of the various oxides and the various patinas. You have to let one layer dry and reheat it, one layer dry to reheat it, one layer dry. There's a special technique uh, that's a ceramic technique that's from Japan called a raku technique. Now, what a raku technique is, it, it means basically like pit fire and letting your patinas determine the color they want to be, not you determining it. You let the piece determine 
what it wants to be, what kind of colors it wants to change. It's all depending on nature itself. It's all depending on the circumstances. I tend to love to work like that because you get these magical pieces that just you just couldn't think of, that you just couldn't come up with. They're not computer aided, they're not computer drawn, they just come up on their self by themselves when I use that Raku technique. Some of the pretty browns, some of the, the, the highlights on the head and all like that is what you get. Now on top of it, when I added the embellishment of color, I added that to bring out more, to, to make you more of come into the piece, but those are all de decorative concept design techniques. We have a question, I can see the question, and it says, who carved it? Your truly, Aaron, yes, is the sculptor and the artist that does all of these beautiful pieces back here that you see. He does it 100%. It's all him, hands on. Nobody else touches these pieces other than him. We do, he does a series. Some of them is seven of them at one time, but he never works on all of them at the same time. He'll work one at a time. When he gets tired of that one, he moves on to the second one. So that's why um, it's so intricate. And uh, most of the time, um, since I'm not the artist, I'm just his better half, but I critique him as though I am a buyer. I'm coming from the outer perspective to let, pe let him know that, listen, if it ain't right, no buyer is gonna come in and purchase that piece. I need to see more. I need to see something that's gonna electrify and reach down depths into my soul to let me know that this is something that I will invest no matter what the amount is, I'll invest in it so that I can share it with my family members or my friends or people that I've never seen before. They come in and say, oh my God, that's beautiful. Where did you get that from? That's what you want. And I tell him, I tell Aaron all the time as he's creating, if you do not take the time to in, and put yourself in that place, it will not be originating for everybody else. So the motivation comes from a little bit of both of us. We both collaborate together. If I feel that the facial structures or the hand structures or something is missing, I will come and let him know before the final process is done. Otherwise, he will continue. And then at the end of the process, it'll be too late to change things because it takes so long. Like I, he said, average, average pieces that we're doing because he's the only one that's doing it is roughly three months, six months, nine months, sometimes a year and a half that it takes from beginning production, from the concept on paper, all the way through the finished process, including hours and time um, going out and buying the different patinas that he need or the, because uh, most of these things here have coatings of resin. They have clay. These are involved in it and a lot of heat process where he has to wear his mask, his gloves, his eye protection gear when he's in the studio because it makes sense for him to protect himself at all times. Again, one of the things that I would like to say are these are, we consider these our masterpieces. We, uh, you know, I, I love the fact, I love the, the clients that we've seen all around the country. I love the, uh, the, the viewpoints. I listen to critiques. I love getting critiques. Um, I take them very seriously uh, because they only make you better. Most of the time when I'm asking a person, what do you like about the piece? I'm not really asking about if you admire the piece. I'm looking for what do you think it's insufficient in? What do you think it would even make it more greater piece? And I try to accumulate that and put that in storage and work on the next piece that's even better than what you see before. Um, again, these pieces are over, or they take over a long time, a long time period. They're up to a year to create some of these. Um, concept wise, this particular piece, spiritual alignment, basically was based on three concepts, three African concepts. One of those African concepts was based on what they call a circle of love. Sometimes you've seen old, if you go into any interior decorating stores, you'll see a group of people holding hands or a group of animals twisted all together. That concept was based on an ancient African concept called the circle of love. It's also based on an ancient African concept called the circle of life, of which if you saw in The Lion King, they were talking about that all of life has a circle on it. You have a husband, you have a, a wife, 
they create together children. The children grow, and as the children grow, they create children and their children and their children. So it's a circle of life. It's a circle of life. For one to grow, one has to leave. That's one of the beautiful concepts. Uh, one of the things that also, the last particular concept that we used on this was a spiritual concept or spirituality, meaning of oneness. So all of that is what I was trying to sum up in this piece. The flower represents the going back to nature, that you don't need a lot of money to be, you don't need money to be there. Um, God is anywhere, wherever you choose him, her, she to be. You can always be appreciative of where you are in life. It has nothing to do with wealth. That's what I was trying to show. It has to do with us all unified, all under the same net, not an economic level, not a not thinking about what we could do. It's just all of us being together. So that's what I tried to show in this. The piece again is called Spiritual Alignment. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you like it. Check it out. Um, I want you to also go to our website, ourstorystudiosart.com, um, and you can always get in contact us if there's anything that interests you or anything you have more questions on. We're here all the way up until Sunday, yes. so if you have any questions, the first place you should be calling us is with the texting us your information, getting in contact with us through the virtual show here, and just letting us know what you think what you like, what you don't like about the piece. We would love to hear your feedback. And I also would like to just want to say on a positive note, I want to just give accolades and many thanks to our virtual hostess, Miss yes. Louise Cutler, yes. for the Beauty of Blackness uh, Fine Art Show. She has done a tremendous job thus far. And a lot of people do not recognize how hard she worked behind the scenes to get us to all work together to make this make this a real positive um, virtual show for the future. Because this is our new norm that we're looking at. And we want people to always engage. We want next year to be bigger than this one actually is now. Because we're starting this now. That means more artists, if you are trying to become an artist and you want to do more things with your artwork, this is your opportunity because you're reaching mass of people that you're not even aware that is watching. They're always watching everyone so the words that come out of your mouth should be inspirational it's never us downplaying or putting every uh, all the other artists other artists down yes. we're in here to encourage we're all together. of you that do what you do you do it perfectly you're profound in what you do yes you need to continue your journey yes. because it speaks volumes Yes. When you have pieces, you share it. When yes. you share it with all these media platforms, that's what you're there for. I think one of the things that most most uh, collectors, well, the collectors and general people are not, like I said, most of the artists that you've seen in the show, this is our livelihood. This is something that is just not a part-time thing. You just don't partly part-time decide, okay, I'm going to become an artist. It's something uh, that you usually dedicate your life to. Um, it's a lot of things that you put a lot of time into, a lot of personal investment to. Uh, and what you're seeing from all the artists, just not us, you're seeing their craftsmanship. You're seeing, you're seeing their masterpieces as well as ours. Ours, we decided that we were going to view it from sculptures. Some other may be 2D work, two-dimensional work. But they're all masterpieces. Uh, you, you, you know, these are the things that we want to collect as a people. If you're wanting to start out and get a collection, I would suggest that you get one piece from every single artist on the venue. Yes, absolutely. It's not a thing about you don't have enough money. Every artist on the venue will be willing to make any payment plans that you want for a piece of the art. That's what we're here for. That's what we're having the show for. And support your black art, number one. Support your art. If you want to see us in the larger museums, if you want to see us at the bigger venues, if you want to see us in the bigger areas, you, we need the support. That's what it takes. I'm going to go into one of the newer pieces that you're going to see. I'm going to pull this one up. The next piece on our list is going to be called Kimba. This is this piece right here. It has a, a lot of natural elements into it, so that you can see it very much up close. This piece is one of our typical pieces that we normally 
show we normally have. Many years ago, we did one that was called African Healer. And from there, most of our clients have went crazy for it. We could never keep African Healer. I've, I've done an African Healer in Chrome. I've done one in bronze. I've done one in this. This one happens to be a super special one that we saved for this show because this is one that has some of those natural elements in this. I'm going to turn this sideways so you can see the natural bamboo that's in the hair. So when you see that, you can see that, that some of the bamboo that's in the hair, all the adornment, meaning the jewelry was created. It has what they call a mint green patina on top of iron oxide. So the browns that you're seeing in the hair, that's iron oxide. It has a bamboo necklace with all with, with all kinds of custom beading that we did. We took some hammered wire and created a beautiful copper necklace. It even has a South African coin that's dated on it. So it's super authentic. Super, super, super authentic. And of course, it's on a black granite base. It's one of a kind. We have a question. Let's answer our question. Okay, I'm going to read it out. This is from Mr. David Michael Boyd, he says, hi, I'm a friend of Louise, watching from Glenwood, Iowa. Because I'm here preparing for my mother's funeral, she passed September 3rd, being here and looking through family pictures has given me a feeling and an awareness of a family circle. So this piece resonates with the sense of connectivity to my pre predecessors. Thank you. Well, Mr. Mr. Boyd, we would like to send, first of all, we're going to give our condolences yes. on your loss. Yes. That's first and foremost, yes. because we resonate with what you're talking about. Yes. We both have lost parents in this, uh, not in just the pandemic, but years of knowing them and they've been here long enough. So we and, understand that. And one thing that I would like to say, let's not see it as a loss. Let's see it as a transition. Let's see in that she's going on with the ancestors to help you, your family, and everyone that's related to you in a higher realm. That's the way that I look at it when my parents would go and that helps you in any way. See it as a transition. See it as a transition because that's what we all do. That's a path that we will all take. Again, that's why we're creating this treasures, and I'm so glad that you sent us the text. May you have all our blessings from our company for us. Our hearts go out to you, and may this piece inspire you to become even better at what you do. Absolutely. Just understand that we're not, that they're never forgotten because they're in the heart. Yes. They've always been in your heart when you were birth, first birthed and brought into this world. Yes. A part of your mother is with you. Yes. So understand that she never leaves. She only, like Aaron said, transitions to another pur or another purpose in her spirit world yes. that will help you become very powerful and sharing your love of what she has done in your life with others. That's what we all need. All of us as individuals need an uplift. That's why we bring Peace spiritual alignment alignment into the fact that we know that there is nothing yeah. that's too hard for a God that we serve will do. He will connect us back together. We will see each other again in that next life. We don't know where it's going to be, but We're when we gonna. come yes. to that meeting place, oh, what a day it will be. Yes. So understand that just this is just a moment in time. Yes. But knowing that there is no pain, no anguish they have, They've been released of all the pressures, especially with what we're dealing with right now. You have to be stronger than ever to overcome because the world is changed in a new lighting and we're going to change with it. I want you to be a part of it and join us. Yes. You need to join the, the, the art world as we do the change as well. All of us as artists, well, I'm not an artist, my husband is, but I'm saying as an artist family, we need to jump aboard. And, and ride that wave because too many of the too many of our African artists or artists in general across the board do not feel that they're appreciated. So what we need to do is show our love in so many forms in so many different ways because it's going to reach the masses. Going to let everybody know yeah. that we have arrived. We are here to stay. We're going to fight until the bitter end. So. That, again, is spiritual alignment. 
um, again, the piece represents it's all about three concepts. It's all about circle of love, circle of life, and spirituality and oneness. Kimba, the one we showed you before this, was basically a mystic. It's called Kimba. The actual piece's title is Kimba, the Mystic Messenger. Um, we didn't want to do a female, a female version of a healer yet. Um, we wanted her to have her own different feel, her own different spirituality, her own different vibe. So we created some natural elements. I wanted her and Gina decided, we both decided that we wanted her to have not just your normal makeup. We wanted her to have some natural elements and to see the beauty of how she connects with nature and how we with nature are all a part of God's creation. So that's what that piece represents. The next piece that we're going to show you is a the piece called, the, which is the last one for tonight. And after that, we can take questions or you can see a video. Uh, you can visit our website. We would love to send us all the text or any questions that you have. I'll be glad to ask you. I'll go into a little bit more techniques and what it's like to be a collector and, and the making of the treasures. This particular piece is called Zoya. Now, Zoya is what they call a traditional bust. It's a bust of a female, but you can't tell it, but it has a pack of lions sitting on it, a pack of baby cub lions. Inside their eyes, they have crystals that you can see that kind of like glow when you see them. So they're on, you can think of an early morning hunt, just waiting, just relaxing. And what the word Zoya means it means dawn, dawn of the dead. So they're relaxing. So we figured that, you know what, we're always, as, as basically what our studio does is we work with the figure, the human figure. So what I wanted to do is incorporate the animals into the figure, and this is what we came up with. Um, it has a mint green patina. It has iron oxide. One of my favorite patinas is using iron oxide, mint green. It has a little teeny bit of color. It has a lot of bronze and a lot of iron in it. That's where you get all these beautiful browns when teeny to get these kind of cinnamon browns and, and everything. So the piece is a somewhat light piece. It's not one of our heavy, heavy pieces. It's a very interesting piece. This piece was shown in the Biggs Museum of Art. Um, it has been shown in some collections up and down the East Coast. Uh, it's, and it's, it's still available. It's still here. And this piece is called Zoya. Remember that each one of these pieces are only one. There is no replica. We do no, uh, no duplicates of these individual pieces because we want the person that, or the client or the customer that gets this piece relate to it and say, this is my heart. No one, I can't worry about somebody else getting it from me because there is no other one. And of course, with the artist, with Aaron's signature on it, you'll know it's the original piece because when we provide that certificate, we are going to let you know exactly where it's signed at on the piece. No one will ever know that other than you and us. We don't share that information. And what we like about what we do is that once you get that one piece, Remember, you're no longer an individual. You are part of our Story Studios family because every client or every person that has collected a piece from us are now a part of a family. Yes. We reach out and we let you reach us at any time if you feel like you need to reach out to us. We're going to be here for you. That's what we do. We love our clients. We love everybody, but we really do love people who have shared because we're trying to make them aware and you got you got to understand we have clients who has pieces they they've never the piece has never made it to the light it never made it to the platform never seen been seen by anybody so we're asking them to share their piece exactly. with the world because they need to see exactly where his mind is always doing it's always evolving it's always doing something different so what he has here when it comes out they can't be shocked because we already know he's a master at what he does. Now, some of the pieces that we have, some of the pieces that are going to be in the future, most of the pieces that we have sold in the past, they have all kinds of special items on them. I'm going to go back to the materials part a little bit. 
Some of these items, me and Gina personally have went to Africa and we hunted down some of these things that were treasures, lots of exotic beads that you wouldn't see. We've been to sub-Saharan Africa where the lions are out at night in the mountains and stuff like that. So you're getting something that's authentic. If you've never been to the motherland, this is your chance of opportunity, something that's themed from the motherland, something that has the actual soil in it. Now, one of, the, one of the little things, I'll give you a little secret that I use. When we went to Africa, we brought back various samples of the soil, various samples of the cattle bone. All of that is incorporated into the patinas that you see. So it's almost like even though I couldn't get to the motherland, or I haven't been to the motherland, I haven't never visited Africa yet, you can always get there through one of the pieces because I can guarantee you some of the pieces and most of the pieces have a piece of Africa either on them in the mixture of the patina or as an adornment, Absolutely. which makes them highly unique. Uh, another aspect that you can think of, we've had even other galleries, larger galleries, MS Rao, one of the largest uh, auction houses next to Christie's and Sotheby's, want to uh, purchase larger pieces from us because they are so unique. These are, again, treasures we want you to experience. We, we think that African art is a treasure of the world. Since Africans were the first humans in the world, our concept is we're giving you a piece of the past and a piece of the future. That's what we're trying to do, and we want to show the beauty and uniqueness of it. That's one reason why we both agreed that we wanted to do this fantastic, beautiful show called The Beauty of Blackness, Fine Arts Show, which you should be supporting. And if there are any questions, we would love to hear from you. Please text us. Well, I think we're going to be just about at our end of our time. So we need Miss Louise. Hello, there she is. There She's she is. back in with us. We want you to come in and um, help us, you know, um, recreate. I see that we have, I've been looking at the comments as they're coming in. And I've been trying to answer questions as it comes in. But I tell you, um, if they have anything else, you got to unmute yourself, Louise, because I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Every time I come in, I can't. I, 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 right? I have to unmute myself. So um, I don't. I, I don't see Gina or Aaron. They, they both. Both. Yeah. I mean, I'm here. He's in and out. I'm trying to get. Not that I mind seeing the artwork. I can see the artwork. So um, it is such a pleasure to have you guys in. That piece is absolutely beautiful. Um, Thank you. It was really nice to have um, uh, okay. David comment because uh, his wife just sent me, uh, she had just texted me, and she might have texted earlier, but I just read the text from his wife that his mother had passed. He had he had known uh, that she was going to pass. Um, he had been yeah. going back and forth and, and things like that, and, and she just passed it uh, yesterday. So. Yeah, it was really nice to have him comment on that and know that they are still at least watching the show there. And yeah. I'm really glad that he was able to see that piece and, and connect with it because that's what it's all about for us is uh, sure. having people connect to the pieces, having them connect to the pieces. He's actually, uh, he's actually uh, he does what's called Blues Behind Bars. And I actually, it's a uh, yeah. the blues group that he's part of, Davey and the Blues Dog. And what they do is, is they sing um, uh, they sing the blues, but they uh, they do a writer's workshop in the prison, and then we sing all of the songs that the prison uh, the inmates create. And so I actually sing with their group sometimes, and we sing the songs that the inmates create. And so it's really a profound ministry that he has. So it's it's been a blessing to so many people to actually hear because it's it's like giving a voice to those who really don't have a voice once they go into the prisons. Yes, 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 yes. It's pretty amazing. So I see we have Miss Corinthia in the hole. Um, and yeah, because we'll be, <laughs> this has been a long day. I <laughs> uh, so we're going to bring Miss Corinthia up. And what time do you guys come tomorrow? What time are you up tomorrow? We're between, I guess, if, if LaShawn is at 12 to 1230, then we'll be 1230 to 1. Yes. Okay. So definitely go and uh, check out. Uh, Aaron Paskin's page on the website. He's got some amazing work there. Click on their Zoom link, talk with them one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, go and visit their store. They have some absolutely amazing one-of-a-kind one kind pieces, things that you will not get anywhere else. So definitely go and check them out. 
this is a rare opportunity to be able to purchase some of his work trust me this is a rare opportunity so definitely go and uh make that purchase pick up something unique for your home for your family heck buy a gift <laughs> I uh, love you both Aaron and Gina and I will be talking to you guys on uh, tomorrow or a little later okay thank you right. bye 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 Corinthia how are you beautiful uh, there you go I say how are you and then I hang up on you how are you I'm good how are you looking gorgeous as ever I'm not going to take up any of your time because I want you to have as much as you uh as much as you need okay Okay. It is great having you, okay? Thanks so much, Louise. All right. Hi, I'm Corinthia Pupil, and I am going to start with doing a screen share. You got it. Uh -oh. You got it, you got it. There we go, I see it. where it's okay 
It's okay to be bold, to be fabulous, to be to be big. It's okay. We we can do this. There's enough space in the world for us all to be just fabulous. Hey, let me stop that. Yay, yes. So it's okay. It's enough room in the world for us all to be fabulous. Yes, so I am Corinthia Peoples and I'm gonna um, allow you to shop if you guys want to shop. Let's, I'm gonna, being that, um, I do wearable art. Um, this is a visual art, wearable art show, um, Louise. And uh, she invited me to um, be a part of the show. Um, I do wearable art jewelry. So I am um, very pleased to be here. Thank you, Beauty of Blackness Fine Art Show. And thank you, Louise, for um, your invite. So this is how we're going to do things. We're going to shop a little bit. We're, I want to adorn you. Um, and I wanna create a space where you can shop. So this is how we are going to work this thing out. So in the, um, there we go. Hang on one second. You know, this whole live thing, everybody is needing to get their bearings. Um, this is our way of, of life these days and moving forward. I particularly love it. It's um, a way for us to connect the dots in many ways um, and with many people all across the globe, right? So again, my brand's intention is to intersect earth, art, spirit, and humanity, right? At this time, I'm gonna dive straight into a showcase um, uh, with two of my collections. And there will be more on Saturday and Sunday coming up tomorrow and Sunday. So what I want you to do is you're going to type in CP and the item number. So for example, if I the if the piece that I hold up is 106, you're going to put CP number 106. That's going to be how you're going to claim your item. You're going to put it in the chat. You're going to put it in the feed. Is how you're going to enter your CP 106. Right. That's the example. You're gonna messenger me, right? So you're gonna either I'm gonna get it from the feed, but I need your information. I need your email address at least. But it'll be great if you can put your item number, your email address, and your shipping. Or you know, don't put it in the, the live feed. Don't put your shipping information. Send it to my messenger or my DM, and you can find me at Corinthia People's uh, Designs. Corinthia People's Designs. Corinthia. See, oh, well, you have me there. People and then at designs, okay? Um, messenger me that. And so I can send you a PayPal invoice. And there will, will be a $9 shipping and ha handling cost um, with each piece you order, right? Taxes may apply in certain states. The pieces are one of a kind or limited editions. It'll be timestamped. So if I say there's one of these, the timestamp, when you put your information inside of the, the um, comment feed, that's the person that will get the... The piece that that you like, you know, the one that speaks to you, the one that resonates, the one that you want to join yourself with, um, the energies from the stones that you want, the color, the energy that you want to emit, that you want to hone into, um, it'll be available to you. Okay. Um, so yeah, let's dive in. One last thing, I will mention the metals and the materials on every piece. However, I need you to be responsible and do your research and know your skin complexities. I wanna keep us safe, adorned, and looking fabulous. Yes, so know your skin complexities. So if I show you copper and there's nickel and copper and if you know you can't do copper, then that's not a piece for you, right? You wanna get a piece that's for you. All right, wonderful. So I've reduced prices to make this um, a very pleasurable shopping experience um, and make it uh, 
a shopping experience that you'll always remember, right? So the pieces are family heirlooms, remember that. And it is a small price to pay for something that you're gonna have forever. All right, so I'm gonna start with the first piece. And unfortunately, let's see if I can do this. That way I can see the chat. I can also see the chat. Technology is my friend. I'm confirming. <laughs> Technology is my friend. It is my friend and your friend and all of our friends. So now I am in feed. So I can see comments and I can talk to you while um, while I am live with you. So being that it's live, you get to see all the things, right? So first piece, number 101. Number 101 is a ring. I'm a little delayed. I'm a little delayed, you guys. Okay. I'm going to slow so I can catch up because that there's a delay. So this is the ring. It is amber. Oh, I can't, I can't do this. We're gonna have to go back because there is a delay. <laughs> okay, this is an amber stone. It's on leather, it's textured leather. This is number 101. Number 101, this ring is only like, I'm just doing some really good discounts, right? So, this ring is $35. It is amber, Baltic amber from the Baltic Sea. It's on leather. It's number 101. Number 101. So you're going to put in CP number 101 if you want this ring. I'm going to put it on. It starts at a size 9. It starts at a size 9. But it's adjustable. So you can squeeze the adjustables. This is Baltic amber. Baltic amber supplies about 70 to 90% of the world's amber. Amber is a resin from an amber tree. That is Baltic amber. It is yellow. Yellow is the stone of happiness and joy. This is leather, 35 bucks. Amber. CP, 101. So this is number, again, 101. We're shopping tonight. How about that? Just... Just shop right here, just shop right now, right? Just shop right here, shop right now. We're not gonna make it complicated. And then you can always go to the feed as well. For those who are not present, you can go to the feed and you can still shop. You can send me a messenger, Corinthian People's Designs. Number 102, it's a, little, it's a larger stone. It's a green amber, which is prosperity. The meaning of this one is prosperity. It's a green amber. It's on leather. Let me switch hands because it seems like the light is better on this side. This is number 102. It's 48 bucks. $48. $48. This is the collection I'm showcasing tonight. Saturday and Sunday will be different. So CP, number 102. There's only two of these. Two of these. There was one of number 101, two of number 102, $48. And this is a beauty. I'm going to try it on for you show you how it fits it's very elegant very classy very different it wraps around the finger quality materials number 102 48 bucks 48 dollars just so i can know i'm happy you guys i have your attention type in the chat and tell me how you like the show how you like the show that was number 102 Number 103, I have these beautiful 3D amber earrings. And this is called a cherry amber. This is on sterling silver. 
Sterling Silver and Cherry Amber, number 103. These are $85. $85. Bucks. This is my 3D pieces. This is Amber. You're going to message me your email address so I can send you an invoice, your shipping address. These are 3D Cherry Color Amber, number 103. Again, you're going to put CP, number 103. To claim these items, I only have one of these. Only one. That's all sterling silver. It goes through your hole. And then with complimentary, I will send you uh, plastic bags for these. These are great for the winter time, for summer, for spring. These are rockable, definitely. Compliments galore. Number 103. Right? You can do this with whites and pinks and yellows. Blacks. Whichever you decide. Pop color. I love popping color. Um, this is number 104. These are my toggle earrings. I call them the yin and the yang. You know, sometimes mistakes between your artists, they're supposed to be. I was creating one piece and this came out to be and I said, oh my God. And this is one of my best sellers. I do these in various um, stones and colors um but right now this is a butterscotch amber this is number 104 and these are going for 98 dollars. 98 bucks number 104 for 98 dollars. this is diamond cut sterling silver links and this is butterscotch amber it has the um lever backs so in the winter time when you're wearing your scarves or your turtleneck or a nice puffy coat, or even at a party dancing. Um, this is Baltic Amber again. And these pieces are Sterling Silver and Bali Silver. And they are handmade by myself. You know, jewelry has energy. So whomever these are calling to, that's who they're calling to. Number 104, CP number 104. CP number 104, number 105 is copper. Copper. Copper is the stone, is the metal, sorry. Copper is antibacterial. Copper is good for joints and arthritis and tendinitis and carpal tunnel. I'm going to put these on. You can stack these and layer them. You can get one only. So I'm going to show you the one first one with the heart on it. It's nice, thick and round, and it's hammered. These have been hammered um, and rounded. It's not heavy. It's hollowed out. These are rounded. So the, um, the heart, you would put number 106 for the heart. I'm sorry. Number 106 would be for the heart. And it is 39 bucks. Number 106, $39 CP. And this is solid copper. It's good for joints, arthritis, tendinitis. All of my collection is to give you something. I always say it's cheaper than therapy. Cheaper than therapy, honey. You need, or even going to the doctor or preventative or maintenance after you have had some type of procedure. If you're suffering from arthritis or pain, get you some copper. Get you some copper. Um, this is number 106. It's 39 bucks. I'm going to slide this on. You can wear this as a single. So if you have hands the size as mine, this will fit you nicely. Nicely. Yes, indeed. Yes. The other one does not have any, any heart. It's just the solid, round, nice, and thick copper bangle. And these copper bangles, I wear mine all the time. I get in the shower with them every day. I hop in the swim pool. I get in the ocean. Copper takes a licking and keep on ticking. Yes, it's going to turn green. Absolutely. But it also lets you know when it turns green or when, turn, when it's turning you green that your body is acid. So maybe you need to drink more water. Maybe you need to incorporate a little bit more vegetables in your diet. Or alkaline or, you know, get your body alkalinity, right? Have some green juices. And again, I can just slap that right on. And voila, I have layered I have layered, and this these copper looks good on every single skin tone. My tone, a lighter tone, hues, 
different hues it looks great on and this one is 36 36 dollars this is number 105 so number 105 36 dollars that's that one there number 106 is the one i have on with the heart Number 106 is 39. Okay, we're gonna do some shopping. Let me get over here and see if there's any comments. Anybody has any questions, please. If you have any questions, I think it'll pop up on this. 106. Yes, beautiful. Good. Okay, I'm glad. Thank you guys for staying in the house and staying um, in the room and participating in the in the show. I really appreciate that. We all appreciate it. So this is number 106, and that was $39 with the heart. I'm making this possible. Making this possible. My collection is a combination of me making, designing, and supporting other artists who are underprivileged. Still on copper. So again, if you are, this is, it can be for you, it can be for your mom or grandma or yourself, if you type, um, if you're an artist and you work with your hands, you want some copper on, you want copper on. So this one here is, um, this is called braided. This is my braided cuff. If you have even a thicker wrist or a smaller wrist, you want to get a cuff because the cuffs um, are adjustable. They're adjustable so they can just be squeezed to fit the wrist. Just be squeezed to fit the wrist, okay? And this is only worn for $40. I'm making this possible. $40. These are regularly like 75 bucks. So smash these up. This is number 107. Number 107. $40, $40, number 107, and this is braided copper, joints, arthritis, tendinitis, right? I had some problems with my leg. I think it was like sciatica, and I, I always have on copper because I work with my hands, so I always want to like make sure my hands are strong because I work with them. So I'm keeping copper on, but I, I created a um an angle honey that pain was like what bye bye see ya number 108 again it's a cuff it's called lines number 108 lines lines 40 bucks regularly 65 I'm slashing prices. I'm making this very possible. Okay. And again, if you wanted to layer all these, that's number 108. I hope you guys are writing this down. So you can layer, right? So this is the copper, the single. I still have that bangle on. We can do both. We can do all that layer, honey. That's our layer. We can layer it on, layer it up, layer, 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 okay? So just know that you can layer these. And layering, it's, it's very popular. A lot of people are doing lots of bangles, lots of bangles. Um, many indigenous people do lots of bangles and, we're, and adorn themselves um, more. Um, layer their adornments, lada, right? Um, places in India, in Africa, Indonesia, and these sorts of places, right? So number 109, we're going to stick with the copper just a little bit longer. This is for a man or a woman. This is a cuff. It can fit a man. This is number 109. 109. I'm making it possible. I'm making it possible. These are 40, 40 bucks. 109. CP number 109. Send me a message to Corinthia People's Designs on Facebook. 109. 
So put it in there. CP109, making this possible. This is, again, a copper bangle. And guess what cleans copper? Ketchup. Yes, I said it. I said ketchup. Ketchup cleans copper. So literally, you put some ketchup on a toothbrush, run some water, bling, voila, magic, 109. This also can be for a man or woman. It is unisex. This one here is number 10. It's 110. Last copper piece. 110. This is very thick and heavy. It's a very thick and heavy piece. I'm making these possibles. Yes, I'm making this possible. 110, 40 bucks. 110. CP number 110, if you want this piece. I only have one. So, oh, sorry about that. On the last four pieces, the cups, last ones. So snatch these up, honey. I'm like, damn, you're giving them away. Yes. Get your healing on. Get your natural healing. If you've gotten cut on, use your copper to help with um, helping with your pain, maintenance. If you haven't gotten any procedure, get um, get some copper. All right? That's number 110, 40 bucks. Number 110. Number 111. Number 111 is this bracelet that I'm wearing. This is a yellow Jade, it's called the Nymphat Jade. I have put this big old gold charm. It says Amen in the middle of it, and it has some writings. This is Jade, and then on the other side, it has a charm of I Love Jesus. There. Right? So, and it's on memory wire. So literally, this wraps, unwraps, unwraps. This is $65. This is number 111. So literally, it's on memory wire. 111. Yellow jade bracelet. 111, $65. And to put this on, you start with the bigger piece, right? And you can just wrap this and wrap this and wrap it and wrap it. So the cool thing about this too is it doesn't matter your wrist size, your wrist size. So it can fit on pretty much any wrist because it's on memory wire. So if you have a thick wrist, it'll just wrap around whatever kind of wrist you have. Okay? That's number 111, $65. Number 112 is what I have on. It's $85. Number 112, 85 bucks. It's what I'm wearing here. And this is interesting because you can play with this piece. So it's on memory wire too, right? So you can wrap it all the way around. I had it tucked. You can have it here. Number 112, $85. Number 112. It has charms on it as well. You can also take this, and I think I tucked it. I tucked it inside of one as you're wrapping. And you got it. You can do like all this, this funky. This is for the woman who likes to play with herself, who likes to play and express in different ways her jewelry and who she is and expressing who she is. So this is number 112. Um, it matches, goes with the bracelet, 111, 112. There's only one of each at this time. Uh, 112 is $85. Okay. These earrings I'm wearing, I have a hint of purple in them. A hint of purple in them. And this is number 113, and they're different. They're asymmetrical, which I love to do. Nothing's new under the planet. I've found asymmetry and I started to see other asymmetry pieces. This is 113. These are 49 bucks. And it is on base metal. So memory wire is base metal. It's not sterling silver. So that also keeps the price down. Right? 
So these are the earrings. It has a purple stone on this one. That's the shape, 113, and then the shape of this one, 113 as well. All right? And these are 49 bucks. Okay. And last but not least, for this one for tonight, is this peanut wood jasper ring. It's peanut wood jasper ring. It's a size nine. It is not adjustable. It is on sterling silver. It is $85. It's called peanut wood. Peanut wood jasper is the stone of grounding, survival, and centering your emotions. So if you have problems with anxiety, this would be what you would, um, what would help you as you're on your journey. Cheaper than therapy, wear your stones. Some people keep their stones in their pockets. Some wear them. I wear mine. Um, I think that you can look good as well as fashionable and be beautiful. Wonderful. Vaughn, thank you. 111, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Go to Corinthia People's Designs and send me your email address, please. Thank you so much. So that's, this one's number 114. 111, Vaughn. I think it was the, the bracelet. Yes, Vaughn. Yes. 103, Louise, CP. You got it. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys. Number 114 is the, it's called Peanut Wood Jasper, size nine. Peanut Wood Jasper, uh, 114. This is $85. And this is on sterling silver. It has this 925 stamp on it. Beautiful ring. You can wear this with all black. You see I'm popping it with um, orange and yellows. So it's all about expression, right? So we can do a look or we can do matchy-matchy. So it's up to you, whatever you decide. I like to go with looks. I like to create my look. What, what do I want to look like? You know, what do I feel like? So um, that's number 114. That's $85, number 114. Okay. So that is going to wrap up the collection for tonight. Um, thank you so much for chiming in. I really appreciate you. I really appreciate those who saw something that resonated with your spirit and you wanted to um, acquire it. I am so happy. I will be on tomorrow. Louise is in the room. We made this short and sweet, Louise. Hi, Carinthia. Um, um, will I be able to, um, cause I, I'm going to, uh, go to the store and see if I can, um, get a clip back for those where I could just put the, put it through. Um, cause I figured with those, I could probably find a clip and put it through like it was piercing. Um, cause sometimes they have the little, uh, they have a little hoop on them. That's what I was saying. Your, your ears aren't pierced, are they? Uh-uh. Uh -uh. Right. Yeah. We can do a clip. What, which one did you get? 101? I got the one zero threes, the sterling silver. Oh yes, so Louis, so I can't put a clip on these because they go through. But no, no, no. what I was thinking is, is, oh yes, we can put a clip. It has the, the circle, and this can go inside the circle. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It goes inside the circle. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. That's I, I got them. I'm like, okay, I can make those work because I'm always looking to see what I can make work. Yeah, I wanted a nice piece of pair of silver ones, and when I saw those, I'm like, okay. And I waited because I'm like, is she gonna show anything else silver? Because I don't. <laughs> no, I made it short and condensed. You know, I, really I know, I know, and I'll I'll keep looking. I'll keep looking. I, you know, and uh, so you'll be earlier, I think, tomorrow, and I think right. more. And and so when the comments come on here, and that person, I'm gonna copy them down because I think they're on the Beauty of Blackness Fine Art page. Because um, I get all of the comments from all of the pages right here. Perfect. So I can go back in here and uh, we can dig up the comments. Because once I close it out, I can go to each page and find all the comments on it. That is awesome. That yeah. is awesome. Thank yeah. you for having me, Louise. I appreciate you. Oh, you know, anytime. I, I was like, what? <laughs> I know. I was in here. You know, it's been. 
you know what? It's live and we're doing something totally new mm -hmm. and we're having some new experiences. And you know what? It's just great. I mean, it's like we had uh, uh, Paul Goodnight pop in um, on during Poncho's thing. And, you know, who doesn't want to see Paul Goodnight? I know. And I that's know. funny. I right. And then, um, and then Charlie came back through and just, you know, just to share. So that's basically what it's all about is um, building that camaraderie for next year, you know, encourage yeah. people for next year. So I won't keep you crazy because I know it's late. It is late. And it's late on your end. It's late on my end. Yeah. <laughs> and is this the conclusion of the show? Are we concluding? It's yeah. Not, yeah. Yeah. So, Wonderful. Yeah. Well, this I was the thing for everybody that they that hung in there with the beauty of black and white. I know. Right? I know. I know. Yeah. I know. I think Vaughn was hanging in there for the last few of them, uh, but we there were still still at least ten other viewers. There was you know it was going back and forth with the viewers. So um, Vaughn was making all the comments, but there was more viewers on it as well. Um, oh, there's <laughs> Mike just came through. So yeah, so there was more viewers. It's just that he was making all the comments. <laughs> I was like, so thank you so much, Carithia, for being able to come on and hanging in there. So <laughs> we're going to all go to sleep. It, it was fun. It was fun to even, you know, see the fellow, my fellow artists mm -hmm. and what we do. And it's interesting because this platform, we actually get to to touch everybody or you yeah. hear from everybody and engage with everybody. Because when we were at those shows, we would be on different levels. And, and and you were you were it was like come in and out come in and out come in and out yeah yeah and then you know we would have to focus our attention on the client so we had little time to focus on one another right and then by the time it's over it's like 10 11 o'clock at night we're like exhausted it's like i'm going home yeah so. see y'all tomorrow <laughs> you know? but yeah this has been a lot of fun because we have had um in different interactions and i you know i'm always telling artists you know, you guys can pop in anytime because I'm always like the weird part is, is I'm like, where'd that half an hour come from that I forgot to block out and put somebody in? You know, that happened to be the day I had a half an hour. I was like, I thought I covered all of these spaces. So I'm sitting there chatting all the time. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's why I tell people you never know when there's, you know, so I tell artists, you know, pop in and out. Um, you know, you never know when a conversation will start and we can have some conversations because actually I really like the conversations. I know my sister was like, show more art. And I was like, we are showing art, um, but it's also about the conversations. I mean, people are really enjoying the conversations too. So yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. It's cool. It's almost, it's like, it's a fine, delicate balance of what we want and what our audience wants. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. This is the first studio of blackness. So. We're going to get it, Louise. We're going to figure it out. We'll figure and, it out. And, and I would like to volunteer. If, if Beverly would allow me, if she cannot make it, I will ask the question. Okay. Oh, okay. No problem. If she can't, I will definitely pull you in, okay? Yeah, please. I would love to do that. I would love to open the space and ask the oh. question. Oh, great. Okay. If I had known, I would have dragged you over there in the first place. All right. If Beverly has a problem. Just be on standby. It's at 12 o'clock, Mountain Standard Time. Yeah, so that's right. 11 o'clock my time. Right. So, yeah, just be on standby because I will call you, okay? Sure, absolutely. Anything for you, Louise. All right. Thanks a lot, Corinthia. You're welcome. See you. You too. Good night. You good too. night, everyone. Good night. Good night. See you tomorrow. Thank you guys for hanging in there. And uh, <laughs> this was a long day and I just want to thank everybody for hanging in there and staying with us and watching the show and just being a part of what we're doing. Tomorrow starts at nine o'clock. We won't be going from nine to nine tomorrow. Tomorrow starts at nine o'clock and it's till seven. Uh, but we would love to have you come back and just join us and be a part of this beautiful event and what's going on in the world today. And thank you so much. Once again, tomorrow we are here at nine o'clock and we'll go straight through looking at amazing art and talking to amazing people throughout the day. Who knows? You just never know who might pop up tomorrow. 
we really enjoyed having Paul Goodnight pop through. Charlie Palmer came back through. So uh, you just never know who might pop up. So come back tomorrow and hang out with us. Thanks a lot, and I'll see you again.